from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, again, my name is Steve Winnick. I'm the editor here at the American Folklife Center. Actually, my, my job title is writer editor, and that comes into play in the next thing that I'm going to introduce, which is the new edition of Folklife and Fieldwork, which I think many of you have uh, been handed out on your way in. If you haven't, just wave to a staff member and someone will approach you and hand you a copy. But this is our fieldwork manual. And it has been around for a good long time. And in fact, the first edition of Folklife and Fieldwork was published in 1979. And the author of that book was Peter Bardas, who we are very lucky to still have on the staff of the American Folklife Center today. And Peter and I were the co-authors of this new version of the book. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what's new in the book and also talk a little bit about the history. I think one of the nice things about Peter and I being able to collaborate on this is that Peter was kind of an early student and I was kind of a later student of a man named Kenny Goldstein. And Kenny Goldstein's dissertation was called A Guide for Field Workers in Folklore, um, which he then published through his own publishing company. And it was the fieldwork guide in folklore for years until Feel, you know, the sort of reflexivity of looking at fieldwork became more and more a thing within anthropology and ethnography, and then a lot of books on fieldwork came out. But before that was the case, if you wanted to know much about fieldwork, you went to Kenny's book. And so the fact that Peter uh, distilled a lot of the wisdom that he'd gotten from Kenny, and that I then got to, to rework some of this as well in this new edition was very nice for both of us, I think, to, to acknowledge uh, Kenny's effect on us. So what's new in the new edition of Folklife and Fieldwork? It's always been a great guide, introductory guide, on how to do fieldwork. And I know that a lot of people who worked on our field projects and then a lot of people who've worked on field projects and field schools that we've run have used the book. Um, but we did make a few large changes in the new edition. In particular, we decided to make it a little bit more chronological so that we essentially laid it out in the order in which you would think about things when you're doing a fieldwork project. So you have to think about the ethics up in advance, right, before you actually design the project. So that's up toward the beginning of the book. So that made a big change in the book from, from the old uh, version. And what, one thing that's nice about that is that it allows the table of contents to essentially be a checklist of things that you have to do um, on the way to doing a fieldwork project. So if you take a look at, at that, you'll, you'll see that as one uh, aspect of, of the new nature of the book. A second thing is that the tone has gotten uh, a little bit lighter. We were hoping for a kind of a broader audience, uh, maybe to be able to use it with advanced undergraduates, but also to use it with graduate students and with uh, professionals. And for that reason, we adopted what I said in an early production meeting. I used the word breezy, and that became a, a kind of a joke among us. So this is the breezy version um, of folk life and field work. And a third thing that you'll notice is some uh, issues that we weren't able to talk about at length in the book, but that we wanted to introduce are brought up in these little green text boxes. And it's kind of interesting to hear uh, the, a lot of the issues that were brought up during the morning and see how we dealt with some of them in folk life and field work. So I'll say on, on page six, if you want to flip to page six, on the very bottom there's a, a green box that says, one of the first decisions to make is whether to do your field work alone or in a team. Many of the best field projects in the AFC archive were accomplished by teams of field workers rather than individuals. Teams allow you to divide the labor to document the process of field work, for example, by photographing interviews in progress, and to brainstorm with teammates. They also require you to negotiate with your teammates, beginning right here with the goals of the project. So again, we're putting that in where you'd have to make that decision, which is when you're thinking about what you actually want to accomplish. Um, another example is on uh, page 11, uh, when we talk about the IRB and you know the issue that if you're at a university, you may run into this issue and you have to be conscious of it. So those are things that we tried to bring up, these kind of both practical and theoretical and ethical concerns that you might have, and to bring them up in a way that essentially directs you to our website where we have larger discussions of these issues uh, for you. 
So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's one thing to say about the new book. And then uh, the, the other thing is just that you know it's gotten a, a new design look so that it's uh, in color now. And we hope that that'll help uh, folks to interface with it. You know, it'll make it sort of more eye-catching. So that's Folk Life and Fieldwork. It is now a physical book, which you can hold in your hands, as you see. Uh, it's also a PDF, which is going up on our website as soon as we can make it accessible. So keep uh, you know, revisiting our website. And very soon, within the next couple of weeks, we're going to have Folk Life and Fieldwork up there as well. So now, and it's free. It's free of cost, so if you are interested in using this in your classes or in using this for any kind of field project that you're doing, just uh, give us a call or send us an email at folklife at loc.gov, and we will send off to you as many copies as you need. Um, we have taken delivery of 11,000 copies of this book today, so <laughs> we have a few to give away. So now we're going to move on to our, uh, our next, uh, the next part of our symposium. Yeah, and, and this will be uh, Nicole Saylor is going to talk about uh, audio on the web. So come on up. Hello again. <clears throat> All right. The idea behind these 10-minute collection features uh, is to allow staff an opportunity to highlight parts of the collection. Uh, and since our AFC um, pre-1950s disc recordings um, are so well known, I thought I'd move beyond what's actually in the collection and discuss um, how our thoughts are developing around making um, accessible this trove uh, to scale. So I want to thank AFC staff, um, many of them, uh, Marcia, Todd, Maggie, Jennifer, Steve, Judith, and many others who have deep knowledge of this uh, collection and took the time to explain and re-explain uh, all the idiosyncrasies uh, of it and its various iterations. Um, oh, I need to drive. Okay, in short, um, the pre-1950s disc collection includes seminal field work conducted by John Lomax and his son Alan during the time um, they worked at the Library of Congress. Uh, they recorded legendary musicians such as Lead Belly, uh, Woody Guthrie, Jelly Roll Morton. Uh, there's some other field work materials in there, Haiti uh, field work from the 30s, and uh, work from the upper Midwest. Uh, there's also uh, other collectors' materials, Herbert Halpert, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Vance Randolph, and others. So I've had friends and colleagues, uh, colleagues who aren't uh, archivists, remark, uh, you know, that's such great stuff, you should just put that online. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we should, and of course we have. Uh, we've started, anyway. Um, but responsibly scaling access um, to the collection uh, online is a major initiative for us, as I mentioned earlier. But there are some hidden complexities inherent uh, in mounting a large AV collection that need to be sorted out before we just put it online. And so I'll just walk you through um, a few of those things. Okay, so first some context, right? Um, the date span of materials in our archives ranges from 1890 to 2016, so that's about 125 years worth of documentation on every imaginable audio uh, visual format. Uh, so we're, we're a fairly contemporary archive by, by many standards. Um, and so the topic today is the orange there. It's the, um, the disc era, which was largely the 30s and 40s. Um, and so I'll also men mention descriptive tools uh, that help you access these, and that's the card catalog. And that was started in 1933, I'll talk about that more later, because the Lomaxes were eager to start uh, publishing the material they collected right away, and they needed a way to organize it. And so, um, flash forward to 2007, uh, that card catalog uh, information went online. Um, so now flash forward to 2016, where we are today. Um, and we are a dozen years away from marking the 100-year anniversary of the archive, founded in 1928. Um, the date for us, uh, 2028, has uh, come to not only mark the anniversary of the archive, but it sort of sits out in the distance as a marker for where we want to be with our um, preservation work on audiovisual materials. So the Library of Congress National uh, Recording Preservation Plan uh, says that many analog recordings must be digitized within the next 15 to 20 years. 
um, and this is to avoid degradation and obsolescence. And so um, we figure that by the time we hit the 100-year mark, we ought to have this problem solved, or at least well in hand, um, as much as, as we can. So um, this is why we're preparing to conduct a comprehensive assessment of our AV holdings and start making some um, moves toward uh, seeking external funding for, for ramping up that work. Okay, so in the digital world, well, in the analog world, of course, you've got uh, two main pieces of information from the field. You've got the recording itself, and then you've got uh, the field notes. Now, often they would use disc sleeves to write information about the recording. Um, they would sometimes use notebooks. Um, and I'm ignoring the fact that they took photographs, just for simplicity's sake. But yes, those are the main components of, of the field work from this era. So in the digital world, that turns into audio files and metadata, right? Metadata, description about data. Okay, so, so WPA workers created the catalog in the 30s and 40s, and the archive staff then uh, continued to build it through the late 1960s. Uh, it's still in our reading room. It's kind of a cool artifact, but it also does get active use. People like to go to it, um, even though it is also online. And here are the happy people who made it go online. Um, some of them are in the room, I believe. Uh, this was a real game changer for the archives, and it remains a widely uh, used resource. Not only um, was the information transcribed into a database, but the cards themselves were imaged and included online. Um, so the issue now is that the database needs to be migrated out of an old, unsupported software uh, into uh, a new library environment. So this seems like a great opportunity to sort of reimagine uh, what this would look like with, with the sound um, attached. So V3, as I like to call it, would be online access uh, to, to the whole shebang. Except it's a little complicated. And um, a caveat, my numbers are slightly squishy, so I don't hold, hold me to them, please. But um, so it should be noted that um, we have more digitization to do in the collection. What happened in the late 60s and early 70s was uh, a wholesale transfer of the disks to tape. And so we have um, these materials on tape. Now, we also have digital copies of the tape. We have digital copies of the disk. Um, yeah, so there's a little bit of sorting out to do. Two minutes, oh my goodness, all right. Well, I'm saving you some, from some minutia. Right, okay. Um, flash forward, we have a digital, um, we have the National Audiovisual Conservation Center and a fabulous engineer named Rob Cristarella who uh, works hard uh, digitizing the materials for us. So um, when we consider what to do, you know, how to get this stuff online um, in an efficient and cost-effective way, we have to think about things like, you know, do we go to the source material, which is, of course, the, the better quality choice typically, but is more expensive and time-consuming to transfer. Um, and we have to look at condition issues across the two formats. Is the, is the real good in this case? Is it better than the disk? And so there's a lot of um, evaluation. And there's also duplicates, right? So there are duplicate <laughs> disks. And anyway, so there's some things to unnarl and in the interest of time. Ha, I almost killed this slide, but it was too hilarious. So I had to keep it in. Uh, I don't quite know how to articulate it, but we have got, <laughs> so we've got, two digital files from uh, side A and side B of a disk, for example. And then you digitize a reel, reel-to-reel -reel tape, and you can get uh, a file or, or multiple files, depending on how it was ordered. Um, and then the card catalog has um, track-level information, so yet a more granular, like more granular than a disk side, it has the various tracks on a particular side. So when you look to unite these in a digital environment, it's, it's tricky, to just put it briefly. Um, anyway, so we think about you know, people zip up raw data and they, they hang it online. We're probably not going to do that for various reasons. Um, and then there's this, what we call handcrafted, where you sort of sit there and, and preciously cut, cut out um, all your tracks and, um, you know, edit your, your metadata, which is now, oh, okay. So, um, moving on, <laughs> I'll just say that we, took, we did a little experiment with the uh, Lomax in Michigan materials. We used a, we attempted a pilot 
uh, more product, less process is what we call it in archives land, where you try to uh, sort of be a little less precious and, and get more out there. And so we did things like um, we took all those track level um, records and we smushed them into one record. So you'll see that the title is like title colon title. I mean, so it's a little ugly. The transfers are uh, flat. They aren't speed corrected. They aren't anything. Um, they're also, um, they're not, you know, synced up or timed, stamped to to the metadata at hand. I'll stop there. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks very much, Nikki. I, I'm Nancy Gross again, and I'll be, as as I speak, actually, if the panelists for this uh, next panel would like to to come up, well, um, in no particular order, I'm going. We're going to be talking about the Occupational Folk Life Project in, in particular, and uh, um, our, uh, and the community engagement in collecting in a digital age. And uh, while everybody's taking their seat, I'll just tell you a little bit about this project, which is was an innovative born digital uh, history documentary, oral history documentation project that the American Folklife Center initiated in 2008 as a, if initially as the American Works Project. And it was kind of conceived at the height of the Great Recession as an oral history project to document the voices and concerns of contemporary workers. And it was honestly inspired by the 1930s WPA American Life Histories and previous occupational um, histories that are here at the library, and we consider one of the uh, the gems of our collection. Um, occupational um, folklore, folk life collecting goes through periods like any other trends in um, in folk folklore scholarship, and for the, it's um, now ascending again. For many years, people weren't doing it for a number of reasons that we can just discuss during the course of this panel, um, but. Uh, this, uh, the Occupational Folk Life Project was launched, as I say, in, in uh, 2008 and started off well. It was a really aided by the fact that um, Peggy Bolger, who was then the director of the American Folk Life Center, arranged for funding for Archie Green fellowships to be given to people throughout through a competitive scholar, um, fellow, fellowship program. Um, to people throughout the country to do research in their own communities and share that material with us. To date, we have almost 600 substantial interviews with American workers from throughout the United States, and more are being added to the American Folk Life Center's archives every week. Um, and today's speakers are all uh, all awardees of the Archie Green Fellowship. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'll introduce them, and then we can um, uh, perhaps take turns. They'll each take about ten minutes to talk about their projects, and we can um, and then have time for some uh, question and answer at the end. So um, the, first, I'd like to introduce Bob Bussell who is the Associate Professor of History and Director of the Labor and Education Center at the University of Oregon. And he's joined by Bobby Soton of the Service Employees International Local 503 in North Bend, Oregon. And they designed and worked on a 2015 Archie Green Fellowship called Taking Care, Documenting the Occupational Culture of Home Health Care Workers. Um, there is, next to them is Candace Taylor, who is Director of Taylor Made Culture in Los Angeles, California, who received a 2013 Archie Green Fellowship to document hairdressers and beauty shop culture in America. Next to her is Maida Owens from the Louisiana Division of Arts in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who oversaw a team of researchers um, for the 2014 Archie Green Fellowship documenting Baton Rouge small businesses and trades. And finally is Chris Mulet. Uh, from the Brooklyn Arts Council in Brooklyn, New York, who received the two, uh, 2015 Archie Green Fellowship to work with Domestic Workers United in Brooklyn, New York, to document domestic workers in the New York metropolitan area. So very diverse. And of the 30-some-odd um, projects that have been involved with the Occupational Folk Life um, Project, uh, it, it, we've been delighted by both the geographic diversity and and the uh, the 
different occupations that have been highlighted, and we specifically um, we're specifically delighted that um, most of the one of the people and teams who've gotten support are working in trades and occupations that are frankly under documented at the American Folklore um, Folk Life Center. So they're helping us enrich our archive. So with that, I'm going to go tromp across the stage and take my seat. And uh, would you like to start off with the Oregon? Sure. Material? OK. Sure. Uh, well, um, well, thank you very much, Nancy. And I just first want to say thank you to the American Folklife Center and the Library of Congress. Nancy was a dream to work with throughout this process. So thank you very much uh, for, for that. And I'm delighted to be joined by Bobby Soten, who's a caregiver and also an interviewee. So we're going to divide our time here in talking briefly about our project. So we also, in addition to taking care, we started to call this work and the things that are growing out of it the quiet revolution. Uh, because caregiving, uh, people that care for the elderly, disabled, people that are uh, physically uh, or developmentally disabled, often work in private homes and their work isn't often seen. They care for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And oftentimes their work was not that well recognized uh, or given that much dignity or respect until the advent in Oregon and elsewhere of collective bargaining and unionization. So that's part of our story in addition to documenting the occupational culture of these workers. We had a wonderful team that worked on this project. I want to also acknowledge my colleague at the Labor Education Center, Helen Moss. Uh, we had two folklorists, Nathan Moore and Don Stacy. And Don Stacy is himself a home care worker and another videographer, uh, Sonia Delacruz. And also, we could not have done this without the cooperation of service employees, uh, International Union Local 503, that represents over 11,000 of these workers in the state of Oregon. So I wanted to first answer a couple of questions just about the logistics of the project, as Nancy had requested, that we interviewed 35 workers. 24 were women, 11 were men. It is an industry that tends to be dominated by women. And we tried within that relatively small sample to get as much racial and ethnic diversity as we could. So we interviewed workers from Eastern Europe. They're a group of workers that increasingly have gotten involved in home care, Latinos and some African Americans as well. And we interviewed people from both urban, rural, and suburban areas. So we also tried for geographic diversity. And I would just say I'm going to talk about four major themes very briefly that grew out of this research. But I would just say this, would share this with you, that one of our inside jokes about the project was as we got into this, that we thought that we should have brought tissue or, or handkerchief boxes with us, or the interviewee should have, because invariably somebody almost broke down into some level of tears when we heard just these rich and profound stories uh, from these workers. These interviews lasted from a half hour to an hour. So let me just say a couple of things about the interviews, and I'm going to use little snippets of uh, words to convey what was going on Thematically. One theme was the previous experience with caregiving. As one worker put it, we were always taking care of somebody. Almost everybody we interviewed had some experience, many people caring for relatives, family members. It was really something that seemed in people's blood or DNA that caregiving was something that was familiar to them and uh, was not something that seemed out of the ordinary. So they carried that on very directly into their work. It was an extension of who they were and their identity. Uh, Another piece of this was a profound sense of mission. As one worker memorably put it, this is work that is good for the world and good for your soul. Uh, many people talked about giving consumers or their clients the lives they want, the lives they need. Um, excuse me. And um, one caregiver who cared for her autistic child said, my son is going to have a life due to this type of work that we're doing. Uh, I have a brief film clip I wanted to ask you if you could cue up. This is a home care worker named Edward Smith, uh, and I think you get a sense in this very brief film clip about what this work means in terms of mission. Can, can, we, can we run that? It's possible, so should, please let me assist you. Keep in mind, when you're taking care of a disabled person, mm -hmm. always trying to put yourself in their shoes about what they can't do, and understanding that, you know, I have legs. I am her dancing shoes. I am her walking through the mall. I am all those things. Pero creo que you can stop it there. I believe. I'd love to show you more, but I think you get a sense from Edward's quote, just the meaning of this work. 
Um, and the worker who came on afterwards was also talking about how removing the stigmas from people with disabilities, a memorable quote from Neftali Garcia, that disabled folks are not from another planet or universe. So this sense about the mission of the work was very powerful. Uh, someone else talked about an amazing journey with each client, the relationships, the deep relationships that often develop between caregivers and the people they care for. Uh, one example of this was giving people a sense of choice. So bathing, you know, doing the most intimate type of work with people and the emotional labor that goes into that can be very difficult. This home care worker talked about making it into a spa day that they would actually, this was the way in which that work was done with this person. So there's an enormous amount of inventiveness and creativity that we saw in the occupational culture of these workers. And then finally, this, this sense of making us bona fide workers, that uh, the role of the union, that getting a union, being able to be viewed as a professional, uh, as one worker put it, to follow up to this project. Uh, it'll be called The Quiet Revolution. And uh, we just think there's lots of potential in terms of showing this film, the film clips, and the documentary to various groups of stakeholders all around uh, Oregon and elsewhere. We have a presentation lined up at a major labor history conference. Others in our team will use this professionally. So I would just conclude by saying that the funding we got from the uh, AFC is the, truly the gift that's going to keep on giving. Mm -hmm. so Bobby. Um, I've been a home care worker for 15 years, and I've worked with several seniors and people with disabilities and um, it's been a heck of a ride. <laughs> when I first started uh, we had no rights, we had no workman's comp, we had very little of anything until our union came along and said hey you know if we organize you we can we can help and make things make things better so not only has my my union helped with my career because I consider this a career now um, they also help services for the people I take care of. We go to the Capitol every time we get a chance to, to tell them and explain to them exactly what home care is. And these videos are very helpful on telling people or showing people who we are and what we do and wh who, who we work for. Because I directly work for these people. They hire and fire me. The state pays me, but they can hire and fire their workers. And so um, having this opportunity to come here and say thank you for what you're doing and, and letting people know what home care is and what home care does. And um, I know the people that I work for are very grateful for having someone to stand up for them and speak for them when they're not able to. So um, that's one of the best things in the world is being able to come to someone's house and say, hey, let me, you know, when I left, she was crying because I was going to be gone for four days. So um, it's a very rewarding job, and it's an important job. And any time that your legislators are, are asking you to, to pass a funding for, this, for these kinds of programs, please. It's important that these people are taken care of in a matter that's respectful and honoring their service to our community and our country. Thanks. I told you about the handkerchief. <laughs> uh, Ken Daisy? Oh, okay. I'm going to uh, go here because I have slides. Okay. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And thank you to the American Folk Life Center for this opportunity for the, the grant to do this work. It was such a gift. Um, I did a project called American Hair that documented beauty shop culture throughout the United States. And I traveled over 20,000 miles um, conducting interviews in salons that served everyone from African American to Appalachian, Cajun, Dominican, Gullah, Japanese, Lumbee Indian, Pakistani. I also interviewed um, some of the industry powerhouses like the Vidal Sassoon family, um, Tabitha Coffee from Tabitha Takes Over, um, Bob Marley's hairdresser, um, <laughs> Paul Mitchell, and the like. So let me see, I'm going to advance. Okay, and I started this project in 2006 because I was sitting in my hair salon for about 10 years and realized that in the whole time I'd been there, I'd never seen uh, anybody but black people in there. 
And um, one day a white woman walked in and wanted to get her hair done. She just wanted a wash and set, really simple. And uh, my hairdresser shooed her away. And well, she was nice, but she was like, you know, no, I'm, I don't do that. And then when she left, the woman left, my hairdresser said, I don't do white hair. And I was, I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, you know, I thought maybe this is Gigi's the exterior of the salon, and I felt uncomfortable. I was like, am I part of a secret society that I don't know about? <laughs> um, because I lived in San Francisco, one of the most diverse places in the world, and I just be, was glaring how segregated it was. And that's when I started this project. Um, for the next several years, I just would sit under the hairdryer and just study what was happening in the salon and I realized, you know, I watched Gigi, our, my hairdresser, counsel us, support us. I mean, she, everybody went through every kind of emotion ma imaginable in that salon, and Gigi was there for us. And I realized that she was protecting this environment that was rooted in culture and ritual. And, um, and I wondered, you know, if other salons are like this, you know, what about Japanese salons or Pakistani salons? And so that's when I got the opportunity to do this project, when I got this grant. Um, and it was interesting, because then I had to go outside of my little you know, womb, basically, that was so protected, into these other salons. They're very intimate spaces. And so when I tried to go to, say, a Chinese salon in San Francisco, um, it was like you know, walking in, and the music stops, and everybody looks at you mm. like, what are you doing here? And um, I'd say, oh, I'm not here to get my hair done. And they would just be really relieved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this look of relief would be like, oh, God, you know, and why are you here? And when I would explain the project, you know, I would just generally, people were not, one out of eight, that's liberal, um, would allow me to even to do the project. It was very hard to get access. Um, having an outsider come in, I mean, I'm there in their face with this camera. Um, was, you know, it was kind of invasive. And ironically, after getting the Library of Congress grant, I thought, oh, this will make it more important. And um, it actually made it more difficult because a lot of the, these were, you know, um, immigrant-based communities. These were small, you know, they, they just heard government and they were like, definitely not. You know, we don't want to have anything to do with that. So it was, it was challenging. Um, but I, I continued on, I continued to study um, the anatomy of hair and understand that most of these salons were segregated because of hair texture. You know, it wasn't just culture, but there was a logistical issue of hairdressers not knowing how to deal with that kind of hair texture. And so I learned about those differences, the difference between Asian hair and why it's so hard to curl, um, how it's, you know, why black hair just tends to be so much kinkier and curlier. Um, I went to a Japanese salon and saw, it's actually in DC here, and you can see how, you know, this contraption, there's all these chemicals, there's all these things that they use that the salon um, owner would have to go to Japan to get these materials. So, you know, it's not just, I mean, there's a comfort factor of why people group themselves, you know, amongst people like them, but then there's this logistical issue. So I learned about that. Um, and that, you know, easy breezy kind of wave pattern, that took about five hours um, for her to get that, um, that look. Hmm. I also went to Bollywood Salon, which was um, Pakistani in Queens. Um, Shahzad here doing hair, he said, you know, the most, he probably did Jennifer Aniston's haircut for 30 years of his career, and it's very difficult to get Indian hair to fall like Jennifer Aniston's. So um, he talked about that. I looked at, you know, there's this assumption that, oh, the, the blonde straight hair, they have it easy, and um, realize that it's very time consuming and expensive to be blonde, um, and that has its own hurdles to deal with. Um, I was also very interested in the labor involved in doing hairdressing. Um, you know, I interviewed Farrah Fawcett's hairdresser, and he said there's 75 steps to a haircut. Mm. And so he went through that, just the architecture of building a haircut and how much, you know, knowledge goes into that. 
um, I went to a traditional um, African salon, and it was a home salon in Philadelphia. And it was one of the most interesting interviews I did because um, their hair, it wasn't just about the hair, it was re really tied to their culture and identity. And what they end up doing a lot is trying to fix black hair that's been damaged because of the straightening and all the chemicals. So here, um, Afama is getting braids, which is her natural hair, but at the top, it's all extensions, it's all fake hair, but until her natural hair grows out because she had damaged it so badly from chemicals. Um, and they were trained in these traditional um, African hairstyles, so they had incredible knowledge. Um, and there's also, I found a, a white hairdresser who has a primarily black clientele. Um, her name is Rena, she's Sicilian. So again, in Sicily, they tend to have that kinkier texture of hair, so she kind of wasn't afraid of it and knew how to handle that. So she, um, she was amazing. And that, you can see her straightening uh, the transformation. And I was also interested in multicultural salons because, you know, with the fact that, you know, we're living in a, a world where people are not of one race, a lot of people choose to, um, to say I'm not identified with a particular race, and one in seven uh, marriages are interracial. So we're looking at there's different hair textures that are, you know, just popping up, and people are demanding to be served in regular salons. They don't necessarily want to go to a black salon or a Chinese or Japanese salon. So there are multicultural salons popping up where the hairdressers are trained to work on different types of hair and people who are adopting kids of a different race can go into the same salon and get their hair done as their child. So this is a big demand right now. And Miss Mia here is half Brazilian and half black. and um, you know, so her Brazilian mother who has a straight hair is like, oh, it's such a relief that I can finally go to a salon where we can both be served. I was also looking at um, Lumbee Indian women, and there's an African bloodline in the Lumbian um, tribe, and so kinky hair does come up. But this was a daughter of a mother who had curly hair and was really ashamed to have, because all her brothers and sisters had straight hair that were traditional Indian. But she always hid her curls and was really ashamed, and now her daughter has this curly hair and is embracing her curls. And so looking at the, the transformation of time um, was also really uh, was special to, uh, to see people changing their identity around that. Um, and also, you know, if you are have a, of Asian descent and you want dreadlocks, that's a whole process that, you know, they have created at Twisted Salon in New Orleans where she had a steamer nozzle attached to a hose and, you know, and back combed and it was really complicated but they could dread somebody's hair so that was another shoe. And I went to Orthodox um, Jewish Salon in um, Brooklyn and thought I'd be walking into some place that was so, um, you know, I want to say repressed, but just, you know, very somber. But they have one of the leading, um, you know, salons of, uh, for wigs for people of African descent, people from all over the country um, buy their wigs, and they've really broken out of the box of religion. So I am running out of time, but this is it. So I just wanted to, um, to say again, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, continue to do this work. Um, you know, for more information on my other projects, you know, go to my website there. I do have some uh, book um, cards. I have some, you know, information. If you want to come up to me, I'll give you information. But um, again, I think without being able to do the field research, without getting the funding, which is very difficult to do, to get that kind of funding, this is such a critical program, and this made all the difference in, in my project. So thank you for your time. Whatever you want. I have slides also. Um, um, I used the Archie Green Fellowship to support a larger project. Um, I wanted to document uh, Baton Rouge. The larger project is now called uh, Baton Rouge Traditions. 
Uh, it's a small, mid-sized southern city that boomed since World War II. Over the years, um, I've noticed that all too many people like to criticize Baton Rouge, uh, the, my hometown and the, Louisiana's capital city. People love the state and its culture, but some make an exception about Baton Rouge, especially cultural workers and researchers. Many residents, and especially non-residents, think that it lacks any expressions of folk culture, even though it is home to an array of individuals who maintain Louisiana's defining traditions. I started wondering why Baton Rouge is perceived as having no folk culture. I knew that as the capital city, it is a cultural microcosm with people coming from across the state to work. Others have moved here from throughout the United States for employment at the universities and uh, in industry. I began to realize that Baton Rouge had a major uh, identity issue. It doesn't help that Baton Rouge is sandwiched between New Orleans and Lafayette, two cities that are known for their traditional culture. The rapid increase in population coincide with the growth of suburbia. The region includes urban, suburban, and rural areas in addition to small towns that are closely connected to the city, creating a web of relationships and networks. As the economic hub of the region, its population density allows specialized businesses to exist that otherwise would be difficult to sustain. And thus, the Baton Rouge Folklife Survey was born. Elsewhere, I explore the identity issues in greater detail. Today, I'd like to look at the occupational folklore that we documented with support of the Archie Green Fellowship. I received this in partnership with the Louisiana Folklore Society. Nope. Made it up? Yeah. Do I have to point somewhere? Hmm? Hmm? Since he doesn't have them. What? So he doesn't have slides for you. Oh, I sent them. Okay. Uh, since 2013, 12 researchers documented tradition bearers and wrote 21 essays for the larger project. Together, the essays create a virtual book called Baton Rouge Traditions. The virtual book includes an introduction by me in six chapters. Baton Rouge gives, Baton Rouge makes, plays, worships, works, and diversifies. Each essay features photographs and most have audio clips from the interviews. Essays based on field work supported by the project have field reports that are available upon request and offer more details. Baton Rouge Works includes essays on occupational folklore. The Archie Green Fellowship enabled us to focus on people employed in small businesses and trades who have specialized skills. Two of the field workers had already done work in Baton Rouge. Douglas Manger and Laura Marcus Green are both senior folklorists who have vast experience with uh, contract field work. One reason that I chose them is that they had no experience in Louisiana or even the South. So they came with little to no preconceived ideas about the city. This fresh perspective was significant in that they noticed things about the city that I had overlooked or took for granted. For example, the abundance of beauty parlors, barber shops, and nail salons. Mm -hmm. I assigned projects in part based on the strengths and interests of each researcher and provided a list of possibilities, but the field workers contributed ideas and I was open to the serendipity of field work. <coughs> Douglas Manger documented a taxidermist, barber, funeral home, custom sign maker, piano tuner, and a clothier. He also looked at restaurateur Wirt Ballou and how he used his welding skills to creatively uh, solve problems for his restaurant and food processing business. Laura Marcus Green did two projects. She looked at bakeries and specialized cakes, including groom's cakes and the emerging tradition of cakes that announce a baby's gender. She also documented shop owners who specialize in hats and dresses for African-American women to wear to church. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn and John Donlin are a folklorist photographer team, uh, formerly based in Baton Rouge, so they were familiar with the city, um, and have, they've done other contracts for me. For this project, they focused on repair services, shoes, furniture, rods and reels, instruments, and, and jewelry, in addition to a locksmith, a bat maker, and clothier. A fourth field worker contributed to the Archie Green Collection as a volunteer. 
Maria Zarang in interned with me during summer 2013 before starting her PhD work at uh, IU. She came to the project familiar with Baton Rouge and documented ethnic grocers, boudin makers, and tea cake makers. All field workers had difficulty documenting small businesses, especially if the person to document was not the business owner. <laughs> the first to confront this issue was Maria Zarang, who had to abandon her original goal of documenting butchers. She was not successful in getting any meat markets to allow their butcher to be interviewed on work time, and then the owners did not want to ask their employees to do it on their own time, so they simply declined. Many small business owners clearly saw time as money and did not perceive being included in this documentation as a worthwhile use of their money. And we even had letters of introduction from the lieutenant governor, you know, things like that, but it, all of them had trouble. Um, with more time and other strategies, no doubt we could have figured out how to get access to butchers. But she had to complete the field work that summer and so redirected her energies. She put in an extraordinary effort and can't be faulted for not trying hard enough. She would come in every day, you know, she worked out of my office, so every day I heard the tales of what she was trying. She cannot be faulted. Uh, nonetheless, I thought more experienced contract field workers might not have this problem. I was wrong. <laughs> All three other projects had more declined interviews than I have ever seen in a project, but all persisted and were able to contribute the interviews for the collection. After each project is completed, I post the essay online and share it with the interviewees for their review. Some request clarifications, some never respond at all. Occasionally they want additions, photographs added or such. The next step is to publicly present the results in other ways. Since the Folklife program does not have the resources to present the traditions to the public other than through the online essays, I partner with the local arts agency so that they can incorporate it into their programming and expand their constituency. They're, they're ecstatic with the work. Um, but again, we haven't, you know, the floods actually is a major issue. Mm. Um, the project has not been officially announced uh, so that the work is just beginning. And the, the flooding has impacted the region so profoundly that we are postponing the, the announcement and, how, and determining how to announce it. Despite documenting uh, 259 tradition bearers over the larger project, uh, there were many that did not get included. Some of the occupational traditions include welders who fabricate custom outdoor cooking equipment used for crawfish boils and other catering businesses, other small repair businesses such as watch repair, and many other food businesses such as seafood markets, snowball stands, and of course, butcher shops. Finally, the building trades uh, need to be uh, looked at. It won't be easy to change the perception about Baton Rouge. This summer I got a reminder when I presented to a group of educators in nearby Lafayette. I shared the rich traditions that we had found in Baton Rouge and said that their students might find similar traditions in their hometowns. Um, afterwards, one told me that while it was a good project, the problem is that Baton Rouge just does not have a soul. <laughs> I suspect that this mid-sized southern capital city's identity is conflated with people's frustration with state government, the city's horrid traffic, and having to attend dreaded statewide required meetings. Um, perception about Baton Rouge will not change easily, but hopefully this project will give civic leaders more data to consider and expand their concept of what folk traditions are in the city and the region. And I would again like to thank, um, you know, for receiving the fellowship. We would not have been able to explore the, these subjects without it. I'm going to sit, so, but I can use this, okay. right? This is okay. So, uh, hi, my name is Chris from the Brooklyn Arts Council, and um, I work with a team. Um, in Brooklyn uh, on a project called Preserving and Protecting the Domestic Workforce. Um, I worked uh, with a group um, of domestic workers um, called Domestic Workers United. Before we get there, I'm gonna talk about what is a domestic worker. Um, someone who works in another person's home and cares for their children, or an elderly person is a housekeeper, 
um, does other work in and around the home like gardening or repair work. Um, Domestic Workers United is a membership-based organization. They're not a union. Um, they're a base of Caribbean, Latina, and African nannies, housekeepers, and elderly caregivers in New York, organ organizing for power, respect, and fair labor standards um, to end exploitation and oppression. Um, so the two key terms here are, are um, trying to fight for um, recognition that this work is real work. Um, as of today, D DWU, that's how I'm going to refer to Domestic Workers United, has organized over 6,000 domestic workers. There's an estimated 300,000 domestic workers um, in New York State. Um, so the goals, as I mentioned, um, Domestic Workers United wants to make sure there's equal rights for domestic workers, but the recognition of the occupation as real work. One of the common phrases you hear um, them talk about um, is that uh, they do the work that makes all other work possible. Um, they work for very wealthy lawyers, doctors, um, you name it, in New York City, um, Long Island as well. Um, and in 2010, so Domestic Workers United started in 2000. In 2010, they, they passed something called the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Um, so this Bill of Rights was to um, guide domestic workers and, and have them communicate their rights um, to avoid um, harassment on the job, sexual harassment or harassment based on gender or ethnicity, um, to advocate and to understand that they get days off, that um, once they work over, um, uh, and also, yeah, once they work a certain amount of time, they're required to have one day off a week at least. If they're in, uh, they're working in a house or a live-in, they're required to have 24 full hours off of that seven days. Um, it taught domestic workers to use their rights, how to advocate the fact that they have rights, um, and reinforce that the rights apply to domestic workers regardless of immigration status. And this is the key thing for all the workers um, that Domestic Workers United worked with, because they don't have um, many of them, I'd say I think 75% of the ones we interviewed do not have um, their immigration status is, is cloudy and difficult, um, that they don't have the ability to advocate um, for themselves. They're afraid. Um, they're afraid to, um, when, they're, when their employer asks them to walk the dog, which is like the worst thing you can do for a Caribbean woman to ask them to walk a dog, um, and so when they're asked to do that separate job, that's different than being a nanny. But they're not going to say no to it because they're afraid of, to get fired. Um, they don't know where their next job might be. Um, many times this, uh, this status, their immigration status, has been uh, used against them. And they've been, they, people might threaten them that, um, you know, if you don't do this, then if you don't work, you know, seven days a week, then uh, I'll report you. Even though they do, so they do have rights, that doesn't really mean anything. They shouldn't be afraid. So Domestic Workers United, that's a big thing. So this project, um, the idea of working with, uh, on this particular issue, um, and it, the fact that there's, it's such a sensitive issue and there's so much trauma uh, involved in um, the way these workers are treated, um, we assembled a team. So the first um, couple, um, the first women that you'll see there, that's Christine Lewis on the left and Patricia Francois. Um, they are the leaders of Domestic Workers United. Um, they would be um, the lead interviewers and organizers of um, this whole Archie Green project. Um, the next uh, woman is, uh, uh, why am I forgetting it, Ramon, and she um, also works for Domestic Workers United. She's from Dominica, but her mother um, was a domestic worker. A key component of this was also uh, you know, how do you manage as a domestic worker your own family? So she was able to really help us understand that aspect. Uh, Ninaj Raul is the next woman on the right. She runs an organization called Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees. Um, and she was the one who actually connected, connected me with Domestic Workers United. Um, there's, a lot, there's a large Haitian community in Brooklyn, so she was uh, instrumental in making, uh, getting us to connect with um, the Haitian population, but also understanding that she works a lot with the immigration status. So understanding um, how to, uh, one of the things that she advocates for is that these women talk about their immigration status, that it's okay. So um, she brought a lot of information and a lot of help and guidance for this process when we um, had them talk about their immigration status and um, what types of things have been used against them. Um, the next woman on the bottom is Eileen Condon. She works for, used to work for the Center for Traditional Music and Dance. They run these wonderful things called um, community cultural initiatives. So she really understand 
um, you know, community organizing, how to make sure that um, all sides are heard in the process of creating a project or any type of project. Um, so she was instrumental, that's me in the middle. And then Caitlin McClure is a, um, she was a grad student and she did um, a lot of transcription uh, for us. So the methodology is taken um, directly from uh, Carl Lindahl's idea of survivor to su survivor interviews um, during her legends from Hurricane, Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina, I think. Um, so the idea that, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that it would be so difficult for me to sit there and do interviews, um, not understanding all the aspects that these um, domestic workers go through. Um, and I thought that if we did a worker to worker um, interview, it would be more effective. Mm -hmm. It would be a great opportunity for them to, to talk to each other, um, to, to um, explore new issues, new ideas. So in this process, I'm sort of behind the camera. Um, occasionally, I would jump in and uh, ask to pull out certain questions. But we worked for about three months creating a list of questions that they're all happy with that uh, dealt with um, a variety of different issues. And one of the, just to sum it up, one aspect we're interested in is domestic, work, domestic workers inside the home. So what skill and techniques um, does it require to be a domestic worker? What knowledge do you need? Um, what, what sort of uh, communication happens between you and the elder that you're caring for or the child? Um, relationship management is probably the biggest skill um, needed to be a domestic worker. Relationship management with your employer, with the, the mm -hmm. child or elder you're caring for, and relationship management with your own family during this process. Um, you would think that the goal would be to make sure that you have a, uh, the kid, that the kids love you and that they almost call you mom. Um, but many different workers had different ideas about um, how to keep their guard up. A real good domestic worker, many people would think, is you keep your guard up. You don't, you make sure that a child, does, that you don't develop that type of relationship because that can be very difficult for you <coughs> and the child. Relationship management with employers is the hardest part of this. That was always the... Um, difficult stories about um, wage theft and exploitation, assault, um, a variety of awful things that I won't get into. Mm -hmm. um, cultural expressions in conflict. So uh, many of these women, I would say the majority of them from the Caribbean, um, they talked a lot about the, uh, the expressions that they brought to the table, whether it's the food they, they cooked or the stories they tell or the songs they told and how that could be currency but also it could cause conflict when you're um, a woman that's working in a, um, an orthodox household, um, your cultural expressions are curbed immensely. So, um, and when you're working for, with kosher food, um, that can be, they talked a lot about the, the difficulty in navigating that wor world. Um, and also grievances, that was the one thing that Domestic Workers United was interested in this project um, for, is to get these women to talk about the difficulties they have on the job. Um, and to make sure that those were expressed. So, John, could you press play? This is uh, Patricia Francois on the left and Christine Lewis on the right. Christine Lewis is being interviewed. Go for it. You know what? When I was growing up, my parents were working class people. We had people who came to see about us, who comb my hair, who made sure my clothes was ironed. I didn't think when I leave Trinidad, I would come and um, work in somebody's home or care for somebody's baby. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the article in Trinidad newspaper before I leave Trinidad was, do you know, and I'm talking for Trinidadian women, I don't know what the other people would say. Yes. Do you know what Trinidadian women are selling their house and land to go to America to do? Walk people's baby on the Upper West Side. Hmm. There it was, years later it was me. I read that donkey years ago. Yes. And the shame that is attached to domestic work. But you know what? As I look back and, and, and the clout you get from belonging to a movement, is that all work is good. The Father created the universe, and when he created the universe, what did he say? The seven days that he saw his, crea his creation in the firmament, he said it was good. Yes. Dr. Martin Luther King said, if you're cleaning the dream, be the best at what you can do. Yes. Trust me, when I work for the children that I work for, I do the best that I could. You know what, it, you know, you know what is my joy, the Vive? Let me tell you what is my joy, the Vive. When the mother comes home and this little boy, He's holding on to his mother, but he's looking around for Christine with a beautiful smile on his face. The mother don't even have to ask him how his day was. 
the smile tells it. Yes. The treatment he gets when she's not there, I treat him as my own. How could you not love innocence? So yes, so this Bill of Rights, who doesn't recommend, recompense me for the love? You can't pay for love. You can't pay for unconditional love. That I wish sometimes that these people would look at, at, at the work that we do for loving a child, for taking care of your home. Yes. Making sure that when you come back, this child is scratchless. He doesn't have a mark on his, on his happy. eye, but he's just happy. Yeah. So the next part of that that we're looking to is uh, their lives outside of the home. So dual parenting. If you're a domestic worker and you're taking care of your own family, how does that impact your own family if you're working seven days a week for another family and giving love to another child? Um, and education. What types of skills were these women interested in acquiring? Who we choose to interview? We interviewed uh, Domestic Worker United members, um, also day laborers. There was a lot of, um, there was two women we interviewed from Ecuador that were day laborers and um, worked, uh, stood on the street and got picked up in South Williamsburg um, to, and worked with Orthodox um, families. Haitian refugees, um, licensed daycare providers provided us a way as we realized um, what is it like to talk to someone who works in a regulated daycare industry. Um, and also special needs caregivers. A lot of these women would take jobs not knowing that they were going to be caring for an autistic child. Two of them were in that situation. They didn't get paid any more, um, nor did they necessarily have the skills, but they rose to the occasion. Um, outside, access outside LOC. LOC. So I was thinking about this, like what would this, what would be a good way to, to, um, to use this information and uh, how can the Library of Congress deal with it? So this idea of pain porn um, is something that you might hear something about, like poverty porn, where, you, where people are showing um, oral histories or stories that are meant to make you cry. And that's something that this, and not, if it's not put in the right context, that what this, that's what this stuff can be used for. But there's so much more nuance to these stories. And I fear that it's very important to make sure that they're um, shown in the right context and, and shown locally for a particular community that empowers them. So I, I worry if it was just thrown up on the web that it might be used in, in a way that is not going to help the movement. And that's what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, how can we work together with these local organizations to make sure that if the Library of Congress is giving access to it, that it's in cooperation with domestic workers in New York State or throughout the country. Um, to make sure that that happens. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to play this. It was received well. Um, it gave them a chance to talk. The women were also paid um, to do the interviews and be interviewed. <coughs> um, and this is going to be great um, material for this organization, Domestic Workers United, to, to build their movement, um, to build. We've talked about doing an exhibit where they can um, organize people, because really, this is just a, an, an organizing. Um, organization to try to get people to be mobilized and understand their rights. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. We, we have a little time for questions. Would you entertain some questions? Can yeah. we have? Oh. All right. I mean, thinking back. Hello? Yeah. 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 Thinking back to our discussion earlier today about the team projects, I'm wondering to what extent, say, Chris's project and Bob and Bobby's, was there any opportunity for, for cross-fertilization, for learning from the experience of the other project, or Maida and uh, uh, Candace, there was working at least some of, some of the, the Baton Rouge things touched on the same topics. Mm -hmm. Does the Archie Green Fellowship and the Occupational Folk Life program provide those formal opportunities, or is it just Nancy's, you ought to talk to X, Y, or Z? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. I, uh, uh, you mean well, talking well, with other people? Yeah. Well, Chris's project, I think, came a year or two after the Oregon project. Right. Did you have access to their lessons, uh, their experiences, um, or you know, were you reinventing, finding your own way? In, oh, in, you mean uh, across the different across, projects. among the researchers? Projects. Right. Um, occasionally, very often, these come as um, 
local projects with a real uh, community and sense of a point of view. Um, the, these will eventually be available online. Right now, they're, they're not. So in some cases, you heard, um, I, I forget. It really depends on the, uh, I don't routinely, because this is competitive, <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people apply uh, and mm -hmm. are evaluated by an outside panel mm -hmm. uh, uh, and are awarded. Sometimes I do put people in touch with similar projects that have, have occurred before. Sometimes I'm not in touch with the applicants before the awards are given. If there's a relevant project, I often will try to hook them up after, after they receive the award. But because uh, it's... It, it, we're responding to applications from the field. It's, uh, there's only so much control we have over it. Did I, did I answer your, yeah. And I forget, did I, did I put you in touch with each other, I think? I don't, I had, uh, did I have you talk to, uh, to Bob? I don't think so. We didn't. We didn't talk, but now we can. I was going <laughs> to you know? say. I mean, there's just yeah, yeah. There's so much overlap. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, with our projects, that's really exciting. I mean, I would just say that there there have been people who were considering applying for RG Green grants that you know did get in touch with with, with us, and so we had some fruitful conversations about just our experience with the program and any pointers we had. So, you know, th those were really good conversations, and yeah, I look forward to this dialogue yeah, with a number of you. Definitely. Other, other questions? Do you have questions for each other? Just that I wanted to talk to him afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Connors. I'm with the um, uh, Teamsters uh, Labor History and Archives Project. And it's interesting that, uh, Chris, you said up front that the uh, Domestic Workers United is not a union. Right. Yet on, and doing the same sort of work that, uh, that, that Bobby's doing. Is it because that you're, Bobby, you, you're getting state money and, and with these people, Chris, that um, there are so many different employers that are, there's no way to have an election well, or something like that? I'll tell you one thing, it's really hard to organize people who are in individual homes. It's a tough job, it's a lot of work to get people to organize. Our, 503 is working on projects right now to find a way for people to join a union, our union, without being in a local. So they can have a con so they can contribute to changing society and getting people to understand what what needs are aren't being met out there. So um, I believe 503 is probably would love to talk to you. So that's the reason why I wanted to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. I, I have to say, having listened to a lot of your interviews, if I'm ever sick, I'm moving to Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, we would love to have so you. So it was um, just so, it, there, people are so eloquent and so uh, caring about their, their charges and what it meant to them and meant to their communities. It was very heartening to, to listen to your interviews. If, you ever, if people out there watch the news, you will see Oregon is a leader in changing the country and mm -hmm. we continue and there, we are getting a lot of a lot of flack um, a lot of people are putting money into initiatives and stuff to try to stop things from passing but Oregonians are a little mm -hmm. hard to convince that we don't need what we need and uh, they're spending lots of money they're probably is going down the toilet that's what I that's what I'm hoping <laughs> yes thank you for a wonderful wonderful presentation I mean I just find it all fascinating and one of the things that I'm thinking about is the neighborhood where I live, which is very diverse. There are a lot of people that are um, barely making ends meet to those who aren't, who are doing all right, but it's a very diverse community, um, a good number of immigrants, and a number of our neighbors that we've gotten to know do a lot of domestic work. They're working in homes with individuals, either people with um, disabilities or taking care of children. And it's been really fascinating getting to know them. And what this does for me is it challenges me to think more about their experiences. I already have some insights in terms of the complexities and disadvantages and, and even at times uh, mistreatment mm -hmm. of these individuals. So my question is, as just being a neighbor to people that come from these work groups, mm -hmm. um, what can somebody like myself who feels like they're being increasingly educated through this work do to apply this at home? What can I say to them to say, hey, you're not alone, look what's happening here or over there? Can you help me with that? 
That's I would say put him in touch with 503. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It might be outside the scope of this particular project, but I think it's a good question. Maybe something we could discuss over break, um, which I think we have, which we might go to right now. Why don't we, um, why don't we take a break and um, discuss this further? And uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a panel right I should know this. Um, so it, it, all the more reason that we'll, um, we'll go to the next panel. And I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, this has been great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right, today you're going to hear from uh, two people who are leading uh, large-scale collecting efforts that end up in a national uh, library. They're two very different models and they're leveraging technology to, to do the work. Uh, you'll first hear from Kevin Bradley. He's the Senior Curator of Research Collections and Unpublished Materials at the National Library of Australia. And then you'll hear from Virginia Millington, who is the Recording and Archive Director at StoryCorps. All right, take it away. Oh, oh, so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Hang on, I've just got to wait a second for the right dramatic impact and my slide to start. <laughs> okay, in 1902, the newly established Australian Parliament passed the Commonwealth Franchise Act, which set a uniform law enabling women to vote at federal elections and to stand for the federal parliament. We were the second country in the world to allow women to vote in national elections. New Zealand was the first. And those of you who know anything about Australia and New Zealand know that we have a great rivalry. So I'd like to say that women were not eligible to be elected in the House of Representatives in New Zealand until 1919. So we can claim a very tiny moral high ground. <laughs> the picture you're looking at over there is the Regatta Hotel, which overlooks the Brisbane River in Brisbane, Queensland. So you're asking yourself, I know you are, how are these two things connected? Why did I tell you this piece of information and show you the picture? Well, I didn't want you to think the country was run by prejudiced and chauvinistic individuals when I tell you that up until 1965, it was illegal for women to be served drinks in the public bar of a licensed hotel. In 1964, uh, 65, the law was changed after two women chained themselves to the bar of the Regatta Hotel. <laughs> Their action, laugh you may, their action is now recognised as one of the defining moments of second wave feminism in Australia. And I hope the fact about the, um, the women's suffrage might mitigate slightly against the embarrassing announcement. The second reason is, it was in this bar that after the end of the successful meeting of the Oral History Association of Australia, Al Thompson, noted oral historian and professor of history at Monash University, and I were having a drink in what is now called Merle's Bar in honour of Merle Thornton, the woman you see chained to the bar there. <laughs> Al was watching his team lose the grand finals in the Australian rules football, and I was trying to convince him that we needed a large-scale oral history survey project to document social change in Australia. Part of my argument was to use the example that public opinion regarding attitudes to women drinking in bars had so changed that at, at, at this time, people can't imagine it was ever any other way. It has been so... Um, uh, naturalised. Um, and in fact, I was explaining to one of my uh, young staff what it was we were doing, and she was horrified to think that this was true, and yet her own mother would have known this situation. So this sort of cultural forgetting is going on all the time, and a large survey project was needed. For me, it would fill a gap in our collection, an update to a previous project, and Al agreed and led the project. He described it as to be a major project to investigate intergenerational dynamics and the impact of dramatic social, technological and environmental changes on the experience and attitudes of succeeding Australian generations. And he was able, just prior to starting the project, to win a National Library Fellowship um, so that he could investigate the 1938 project, which was run in 1988, which was the last similar project to be run in Australia. Now, the project wasn't run on its own. Listed here are the many projects we've been un undertaken in the past few years. Some projects have concentrated on specific periods and events like bushfires or unemployed drovers, members of religious orders and so on. 
Some have been to uh, nationally significant issues such as uh, cultural context of unemployment, Australia's response to AIDS, the Bringing Them Home project about the Indigenous stolen generation and the forgotten Australians and former child migrants about those brought up in care. Generations project, the one that's sort of in this discussion, is the focus of the discussion and what we're talking about, but it shouldn't be considered on its own. It's part of a larger collection or a, um, a larger set of projects as well as what it finds on its own. So at the National Library, all our interviews are what we term whole of life. That is, we try to embed the topic we are pursuing in the context of a life trajectory. They are interviews with Australians who ensure their life stories, memories, perspectives and personal insights, which ensure, sorry, that these are captured. We plan for all our interviews to be around five hours long, some are shorter, most are significant longer, significantly longer. If the interviewee wants to talk, we try to accommodate them, even though our interviewers will be there to guide them. Interviewers, interviews are a, nego a negotiation, but the interviewee should be in the driver's seat. And if they don't like the interview, they have the right to destroy it at any time. Um, we have a two-day training for our Generations project, um, and all our interviewers are already very experienced interviewers when they begin. Uh, each interview per focused on a person's life history, but for this particular project, we had some themes that we wanted to pick up as well. And so those themes included like faith and belief, family and friends, place belonging, growing older, difference or disability, um, leisure playtime, technological transformations, and so on. Um, other themes grew out of the interviews and one which surprised us all was the occurrence in many interviews of a deep and personal discussion of mental health um, rights. The interviewee has control over the recordings for their lifetime. Unpublished collections are acquired from individuals, and this is from our things, generally unpublished collections require an ongoing relationship with the creators and donors for their ease of use. We ingest the standards right forms into our information collection management system and we manage them accordingly. Our project selective, unpublished collecting is highly selective by its nature. Using, there is no complete set unless it's everybody. Um, using the priorities outlined in the library's principle, library staff exercise judgment to determine the significance of materials and the research documentary or historical value of a collection. But once we say we're going to look at a topic or a subject, we look across our collection, we look for papers, we look for photographs, we look for the whole to embed an, in, an entire research archive within them. The most valuable part of the ARC research project is that we can bring a range of expertise to all sorts of projects issues, of which the selection process is an important one. I said I'd do five minutes, I've just made it to six, so. Um, Generations, we had far more volunteer to be interviewed than we could possibly do, and perhaps you can ask me about that later. It was, um, the Australian's Generations Project was funded by the Australian Research Council, which is a way of funding it, and it had uh, two universities within there, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and National Library as partners. Uh, it ran over four years, created around 2,000 hours of oral history interviews, and all the interviews had time-pointed summaries, like Doug was describing before. Um, we had a similar sort of system that we developed, um, I think, slightly ahead of you, Doug, but um, see, another moral high ground. Uh, and we supplied all the audio recording equipment and all the files are recorded. I broadcast wired files to allow for long-term preservation. Two last points. We innovated because uh, we used a system called Zotero for the researchers. We packaged up those um, time-pointed summaries with all the information and the audio and then you could, the researchers could have access to that material only and search the content and then annotate them and share the information between each other as they worked on the project. So it was a constrained part. And what we produced in the end, apart from the interviews, which was the main part, there were a series of uh, national radio programs, a number of papers, an edition of the Australian Historical Journal, which is entirely dedicated to the Australian Generations Project and a book. And the nice thing about the book is published as an e-book. Um, I forgot to hit my slide. Is there more pictures? Yes, there is. <laughs> Zotero, group library, those sorts of things, and that's the page. So the e-book, we could use our uh, audio delivery system, cite the content so that when a person is reading the book, they click on the link. It takes them to that place in the complete five-hour interview, 
and plays that part, but then people can begin to understand the context and the relationship of it to the larger story and the larger narrative, and of course, the larger library's collection. I'll stop there. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. My name is Virginia Millington, and I'm the director of Recording and Archive at StoryCorps. And um, one thing that has become clear to me over the course of the day is how situated StoryCorps itself is as a project within the precedents set by the American Folklife Center and in the work that's being done today. And just to single out a few people, uh, the work of Doug Boyd and Burgess Jules continues to influence our work and our progress. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, well, Seymour, I think I'll start and I'll ask you. Why don't you tell me who you are first? All right, you <laughs> ask me then. Um, my, I'm Lola Camp. And I'm uh, 67 years old, and I'm here with my husband, Seymour Camp. And um, we've been married for 45 years in March. That's right. Now Plus, tell me who you are. My name is Seymour Camp, and I'm your husband. Aren't you thrilled? Anyhow, I was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I live in Highland Park, New Jersey, across the river, so I'm not very far. And uh, as they say, we've been married 45 years. But today we decided we're going to ask yourself questions we probably never even thought of asking each other all these 45 years, but these questions will maybe some nice answers. Who knows? But anyhow, would you like to begin? All right. I'll <clears> start then. Um, how would you describe yourself as a child? Were you happy? So that is a StoryCorps interview that was recorded within the first few months of StoryCorps' beginning in 2003. And I love that interview, or at least the few seconds we heard, because it really illustrates key principles central to StoryCorps interviews. Those two participants knew each other, obviously knew each other very well, um, and I think that you can hear the, uh, the sincerity and um, the, the sort of importance they were placing on the conversation they were about to have. Every StoryCorps interview is about 40 minutes long, and we have encouraged, although we do not require, people to interview someone that they know, maybe they love, or maybe as a friend, a colleague, an acquaintance. And in that way, I think that the model that has been established within the StoryCorps collection leads not only to the establishment of personal narratives, of conversations that reflect personal relationships, but also uh, conversations that reflect broader social, cultural, and historical events, phases, um, and I think that it's that combination of the personal and the historical that makes StoryCorps an interesting and unique collection and one that we are happy to place within the tradition of the collections described today. I have a few numbers behind me which I don't want to dwell on because those are not the most important part of what I'd like to talk about, but just to give you a sense of the size of the StoryCorps collection, at this point, we have collected over 66,000 interviews in the last 13 years. That's over 30,000 hours of audio. At this point, we have over a quarter million participant photographs. In 2015, we launched the StoryCorps app, which is an opportunity for anyone with a phone or a tablet to record StoryCorps interviews that are also archived at the Library of Congress. Since the launch, over 85,000 interviews have been uploaded to StoryCorps.me, over 100,000 users. In addition to these interviews, we have over 700 edited broadcasts, we have animated shorts, and we have full-length books that contain interviews. At this point, though, one of the things that we're most interested in doing is moving beyond the curated approach to StoryCorps collections and thinking about how to make this amazing collection, which is comprised of interviews like the one you just heard, more accessible, more usable, and um, more helpful to researchers, scholars, the general public, and to communities. One of the things that we're really excited about is thinking about this collection that we've built with the full support 
and uh, collaboration of the American Folklife Center as a site for research and scholarship and education. The slide you see behind me is just one example of research potential of the StoryCorps collection. This is actually a transcript generated by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory in support of a project that tested a sociolinguistic um, idea against, um, against computer algorithmic uh, results. We've heard from researchers who are interested in studying all of our interviews between teachers and students. We've heard from researchers that are interested in studying faith and belief within the StoryCorps archive. And we've also heard from researchers who are interested in specific collections, our 9-11 collection and others. In addition to the potential for StoryCorps to not only be a collection of great importance to researchers, scholars, and others, we believe very, very strongly that the StoryCorps collection represents a multitude of sites of engagement. Over the course of 13 years, we've partnered with hundreds of different community partners and uh, different organizations across the country. And it is our belief that those partners make the possibility of the StoryCorps archive um, a reality. We don't consider our collection to be a monolithic collection. We consider it to be a collection of multiple relationships and partnerships. The two uh, partnerships I've highlighted here, the first, um, you can see an exhibition that uses StoryCorps interviews that was uh, created to commemorate the Robert W. Saunders Public Library in Tampa, Florida. And the second was a memory map that was created by the Oakland Chinatown Oral History Project in which StoryCorps interviews were, si were situated within a Google map of important locations. I'm not sure. My father had a bakery shop, was the first black bakery in Tampa. It was called Tasty Bakery Shop. And I remember I was like four or five years old and I remember being hanging out the front door standing and watching the business and the cars and the people walking up and down. But there was a lot of entertainment, entertainers. That was the Chitlin Circuit with all the entertainers coming in town. And they would walk down the sidewalk, so you would see the entertainers during the day and the night. They would come in my father's bakery shop and, and buy pastries, donuts and twists, which he was famous for, the donuts and the twists. The twist donuts was the, that was the favorite amongst the cakes and the pies, but the twist donuts was one of the favorites. So I use that example, which was used in the exhibition, because I think it, it um, displays a, one thing that I think is very important about the StoryCorps collection. It contains moments so specific and so local that um, you can see how the public that comes to this exhibition opening would respond in an almost visceral way to those memories of food. And I think that um, to consider the StoryCorps collection as one of intense locality and specificity, but collected on a large scale, um, opens up the possibilities and opens up the possibilities for collaboration. We are eager to make the StoryCorps collection more accessible and we are grateful to um, funders like, like, like the National Endowment for the Humanities for helping us to, do, to achieve this goal. We believe that by making this collection accessible, by allowing for community access and um, collaboration with the collection, we can do more than capture the stories of communities and individuals across the country. We can use them to enhance and amplify and celebrate the voices of people all across the country. So to end, um, I'm excited to join this conversation and we are excited to work towards a place where the collection that we are privileged enough to hear every day at StoryCorps in the Library of Congress can be made accessible and useful for a broader public. Thank you. <laughs> okay, 30 minutes is just not enough time <laughs> to get, to get too, too far. Um, where to begin? Um, so can you guys talk about, um, both of you are, are doing large scale collecting work. Um, what's the primary impact of being able to, to collect at this scale and, and what is the, um, what's the most challenging aspect to that? 
I could start. Um, so we we record. Can everyone hear me? Um, Five thousand interviews per year um, through our traditional StoryCorps methods, which include um, stationary story booths in Chicago, San Francisco, and Atlanta. Teams of facilitators, which I think really actually harken back to the the field workers that we've we've heard from today. Um, teams of facilitators that, that go across the country, and an actual Airstream trailer that cycles the country recording stories. Um, we have uh, cataloging systems in place where our facilitators will tag each interview, will create log notes for each interview, and will uh, describe each interview. So that by the time it comes to our archive department, there's enough metadata to make it describable. Without that, I think we would face a lot of challenges in being able to access the information within those interviews. Okay, we, um, we use a number of portable machines which we send around the country. We, our interviewers, are all, as we said in the talk, are all um, contracted to undertake particular work and um, we, we tend to contact them and do it and they negotiate the arrangement with the interviewer. Uh, materials brought back to us, as I said, in broadcast wave format. We ingest that into our collection management system and we create um, uh, access points for our interviewers to create time-pointed summaries, which they create as part of the process. We ingest all of that into our collection management <coughs> system, create a package that we can then export that people can use it and um, match it up with the rights document, which means it can then be made available or not as we go along. But the uh, like Virginia, automation is a necessary part of anything you do. Um, we, we have a small number of staff that facilitate the interviews and, and um, manage miracles in, in keeping those things going and retaining contacts with the individuals as well, as well as providing access to the collection, whether it's open because it was um, um, done so, whether it was uh, written permission or closed for a period of time. Many of our interviews could be closed for the lifetime of the person, which is part of the process as well. We feel it's, it's um, we'd rather them talk as long as they like and tell us things that they probably don't want out there, um, providing they're things that they eventually hope to have made available. So. I was struck that you use Zoltero. Could you talk a little bit about what that is for anybody who might not know and, and how that helps uh, facilitate your work? Zoltero, um, we used in the Generations Project only. It's not one we generally use. And we use that because it was a research project and had a, a team of um, researchers working together on a single base of material. So our collection um, time pointing system has the capability to export a package of the audio and the content. Now Zoltero is a um, it's sort of like a, a super end note. You can manage all sorts of information in it so that you can um, annotate and describe it and then write your essays and it will produce all the citations for you. But it also has the ability to manage um, group um, research projects, so allow multiple access to folders and information and be able to share content. So what it meant was is when a person did an interview, they'd come back and they could either in text or in audio record their impressions of the process and the interview, so it's sort of a, um, um, you know, they can put a note there for posterity that says that was very hard to do for these reasons, or I had a problem with the next door neighbour's dog and we had to tie it up outside, or whatever it is. <laughs> All those things add a huge amount of context to understanding an interview when you're removed from it. Um, and But they could also go in, um, search the time summaries and annotate points in it as well. Um, and there was some discussion this morning about time about how you summarise with um, Doug's papers and with others. And that's a, it's an interesting process to think about how you label information and how you put information in there. And so we use Zotero for the researchers to be able to collaborate um, and to be able to work together to eventually produce um, a series of very different chapters about different topics but using the same base materials that they did, or it's different radio programs or um, different other sorts of outcomes that they produced as part of the project. Mm -hmm. Your talk of metadata reminds me of some conversations Virginia and I have been having about <laughs> metadata. Do you want to talk any about contextualizing those? Um, sure. Um, well, we, um, you know, as a, as a project that began 13 years ago, we've certainly evolved in, in the dozen or so years that we've been recording. And I was actually thinking a lot about um, what our collecting practices will look like in, in 10 or 20 years. When we, when we began, um, we were using a, a series of FileMaker databases, read-only FileMaker databases. We've moved on to a content management system that's web-based. 
We, uh, we used to uh, provide, or we provide CDs to our participants. We're now moving to a digital download. And um, in a similar way, our metadata collection has expanded and been enhanced. I think also with the great support of people like um, Maggie Crusey at the American Folklife Center. We, uh, when we began, interestingly enough, we, we collected um, demographic information that was limited to, uh, I believe, religion and gender. Um, and we collected information about the inter each interview that could be lim that could be boiled down to one sentence description. At this point, we uh, we collect multiple points of uh, metadata with the belief that when we make this collection more accessible, and even now, the more points of access, the better. So at this point, we have interview descriptions. We have time-coded log notes. We have a set of keywords that are actually based on the ethnographic thesaurus. Um, and we continually update that list. We're trying, to, we're trying to make um, our metadata even better, and that's now we're thinking about ways to embed things like copyright statements within our audio files and our photographs. Um, but it's, a, it's an evolving process. Um, we don't have transcripts for all our interviews, and that's something we we're continually thinking about. But we do, um, we do believe that the points of access we have um, at least provide a baseline for, um, for solid searchability. Anything you want to add? Well, we could start the whole conversation again. I think this is a very <laughs> exciting topic all around. Who knows? <laughs> metadata was so much fun, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, let's just open it up uh, for some questions. We just have a couple minutes, but let's try. Does anyone have anything? Not that oh, I saw, but the coming to you. Here it is. Sorry, I, the floor. I saw you. You're the closest. Uh, I was impressed by the first session this morning where we were uh, hearing about social media and the way in which people want to uh, use social media resources as a, as a resource for study or research. And of course, sometimes that will be individuals looking for individual topics. But there's also the, always the theme of mass analysis or data mining or something like that. So I'm curious, in either of these oral history projects, is do you get signals from researchers who wish that somehow they could data mine the collection? And can you imagine any way that might happen? Well, yes, we do. Um Sorry, I jumped in first on that one. Yeah, we do quite a bit, and we certainly are engaged with the digital humanities community a bit in discussing the way we do it. Part of it is the, um, the, the way we expose our content. So the stuff that's publicly available is exposed through Trove, which is uh, like the DPLA Australian version. So it harvests all the metadata that's inside the Times Pointed Summaries, and you can, go, you can now go there and download that information. We have had people do that, and they'll bring that information and then represent it in other sorts of ways. Um, it's limited in that it would be nice to get... I would like to be able to allow searching of the non-exposed content but not expose the results is the other part I'd like to do, which is sort of a complex way of saying how can we do the whole collection rather than just the parts that are publicly available without breaching the trust of the people we have. But yeah, it, it's, um, it's currently there for people to do and people are more comfortable working with um, pictures type approaches to it, but there has been some audio approaches as well, representing the data in other ways, finding content, um, mining it for other sorts of information. Um, mostly, I think they're people trying to figure out what they can do with it uh, more than anything else. I think the main researchers we're getting are people who are wanting to use the technology and seeing how far they can push it. I think politics will, and those sorts of things will definitely come next. So. Did they not find your daughter? Yes, um, absolutely. We've, um, we've heard from quite a few researchers, actually one just on um, last Friday, who, who want to use the collection for, for large-scale data processing. Um, we hear from people, actually, who are very interested in speech recognition. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to mention that while we're so interested in these inquiries, one of the reasons that we haven't been able to fully fulfill uh, these requests is because we're, we're going about making the collection more accessible, again, with the collaboration of the Library of Congress, in a way that... Um, 
that as you just said, respects, uh, respects the participants wishes their, um, their intent and um, their own perspective on the interview materials they've contributed. So I fully imagine in a few years or even later than that, our collection will be used for large scale research requests. But at this point, we're only hearing about those, those requests, not being able to act on them too much. Sadly, I'm going to have to leave it right there. It was we hardly got started, but um, I had questions for Virginia. Yeah, did you? Do you want to, <laughs> well, anyway, we'll do it. We'll do it. I later. encourage you all to catch them uh, on on the break. So thank you. Oh. So our our next collection feature is going to be about the Sidney Robertson Cowell collection here in the American Folk Life Center archive, and there's no better person to introduce that collection than my colleague, Kathy Kirst. And I've been privileged to work with Kathy Kirst now for 11 years, and uh, she is the source of knowledge on the Sidney Robertson Cowell collection, among many other things. She's a folklorist, and she's a cataloger, and she's been with the AFC for a long time. And in fact, she has quite recently retired. She's the most recent person to retire from our staff, and we miss her. But the nice thing is that she's uh, volunteering and coming back to work on the Sidney Robertson Cowell collection, and she's working on a book based on this collection. So Kathy Kirst is going to tell us now about the Sidney Robertson Cowell collection. Thank you, Steve. Lady on Wheels. In a draft of an undated manuscript entitled Lady on Wheels, written by Sidney Robertson Cowell, probably in the 1950s, she drafted a proposal for a series of programs, as she put it, about the life of a lady on wheels. She explained, most of you know that my chief preoccupation for a long time has been the, quote, music that's gifted to us, as an old lady in North Carolina wants to find folk music to me. Robertson traveled thousands of miles in her car, accompanied by her dog, collecting traditional music and song, from the 1930s into the 1950s. In the Lady on Wheels proposal, she wrote, folk song is song alive. It seems to me that folk song has gone on living only where new ways and new uses for it could give it freshness and vitality. Throughout her ethnomusicological research, Robertson had no use for song as remnant or survival. It was living song that she was after. And luckily for us here at the Library of Congress, she left her perceptive and colorful descriptions of the music she recorded and the performers who sang for her in ample field notes, correspondences, correspondence and reminiscences, both in the music division at the library here and the American Folklife Center. Robertson was born Sidney William Hawkins in 1903 in San Francisco, precocious, curious, and gregarious from an early age. She graduated in Romance Languages from Stanford, studied music in Paris, and attended Jung's seminars in Zurich and London. By the late 1920s, Robertson was back in California teaching music at the Progressive Peninsula School in Menlo Park and excited to be attending lectures on world music at the San Francisco Conservatory given by composers Ernest Bloch and Henry Cowell. Here I will refer to her as Robertson, the name she acquired from her first marriage. Later, after the California Project and her marriage to Henry Cowell, she was called Sidney Robertson Cowell. Here's a picture taken in 1929 when she was in her 30s, in her 20s, excuse me. In 1936, while visiting friends in Washington, Robertson met Charles Seeger, then in charge of the music unit at the Resettlement Administration. She soon became his assistant and also proficient at making instantaneous disc recordings. As she put it, I got hooked on the work and the wonderful, hopeful, and dedicated New Deal. So when Charlie asked me to stay on, I couldn't resist. With resettlement and then the Farm Security Administration, Robertson traveled thousands of miles on her own, making hundreds of recordings of traditional music throughout the South, the Ozarks, and into the Midwest. When funds from Washington for further recording dried up, she gave her remaining contacts to Alan Lomax for his later forays into Croatian, Finnish, and other communities in the upper Midwest, and she returned to San Francisco. 
There she hoped to create a survey of Northern California folk music on her own by recording English language and what she called minority immigrant groups, supported through the WPA, the Works Project Administration. Without giving much background here on the complicated process it entailed, let me just say that it, she was successful and it was quite an achievement. Robertson was 33, energetic, outgoing, and eager to record what people were singing, wherever and whenever she could. She secured co-sponsorship for the project from the Library of Congress, which among other things sent blank acetate discs for making recordings. And from the University of California, Berkeley, she was provided an office on Shattuck Avenue for 20 workers she handpicked from the California relief rolls and were required by the WPA. Once the project opened, Robertson supervised the staff during the day and in the evenings and on the weekends, she took her baby portable Presto recording machine, as she called it, new on the market at the time, out and about to make recordings wherever she could. Here she is making copies for the Library of Congress of the recordings that were made. So from October 1938 through early 1940, Robertson recorded 35 hours of music from numerous California performers on the project. WPA staff took photos and made technical drawings of many of the musical instruments. She hoped that her project would become a prototype for the collection of folk music across the country, something that had never been done before, especially with the inclusion of the music of recent immigrants. It is really hard to describe the breadth of genres recorded from so many cultural groups in 10 minutes. Two thirds of the recording were what she called minority groups. She was sensitive, as we are now, about the word foreign. Um, she, um, so she called them minority groups, Armenians, Basques, Finns, and you see this quite impressive list. Then one third of the collection was English language material. And she even went so far as to call some of the migrants from Wisconsin and the upper Midwest immigrants to sort of level the pay playing ground of what she was recording. She was very aware of this. In a September 1938 San Francisco Chronicle article, Robertson wrote about California's rich cultural heritage, including the Native Americans, the early Spanish and Portuguese arrivals, and the discovery of gold, which brought settlers from five continents and the seven seas. How can we believe that these successive waves of hardworking citizens contributed nothing to California beyond the work of their hands? What traditions came with them? What were they thinking and feeling as they labored in mines and forests, herding cattle and sheep along the slopes, plowing and harvesting in the valleys and fishing along our coasts. Their songs will tell us if we can find them. How does one find songs, she asked. They are everywhere at hand. A man changing a tire on Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley last month sang an old ballad as he worked and was startled by an urgent request to repeat it so it could be written down. A receipt for a bill for a rail to a paid to a railway express delivery man was signed with a Basque name. This led to a whole nest of songs. And one man in Shasta County offered to outsing the gas tank if he might ride along to Fresno. My thought is to give you a teeny taste of the recordings. Um, these two recordings, if I can fit them in, um, or portions, um, feature songs um, about the homeland that many of the immigrants left behind, central to the story of migration. This is Ruben Baboyan. Robertson attended all sorts of events of the Armenians, visited their coffee shops, and she was entranced by the lively variety of music making she found in the community. Her field reports tell that Mr. Baboyan was an unusually fine singer who had learned all his songs as a boy in the Armenian mountains near Van, currently in eastern Turkey. The role of folk singer was traditional in his father's family, she wrote, and he learned these songs in the pure Armenian style, free of any Turkish taint. Anduni is an Armenian folk song often translated as the homeless. Following the First World War and the Armenian genocide in 1915, that included massacres and deportations near Babuyan's original home. 
And this song has become emblematic of the losses experienced by Armenians and continues to hold great symbolic meaning for those in the diaspora. <laughs> Next slide, please. Eleanor Rodriguez was one of three women from Puerto Rico who sang children's songs and games, Christmas songs, or aguinaldos, and other popular tunes for Robertson in Oakland, where many Puerto Ricans migrated. In Eleanor Rodriguez's version of Lamento Boricano, a sense of heartfelt emotion and deep longing for Puerto Rico imbues her singing, although her pronunciation and articulation reflect the fact that she was a second generation Puerto Rican. contento con su cargamento para la ciudad ay, para la ciudad lleva en su pensamiento todo el mundo lleno de felicidad ay. This popular bolero was and continues to be a heartfelt song among Puerto Ricans with its nostalgic imagery and sense of longing for the homeland. So this has been a mere glimpse of the valuable and expansive California Folk Music Project collection, organized and carried out single-handedly by a remarkable, ambitious, and open-minded collector in only 17 months in California during the New Deal. There is much, much more about this collection that I have absolutely no time to talk about with you today, but you can find most of the collection online here at the library on the California Gold site including the photographs, the scale drawings, the field reports, and all sorts of other things. It will be migrated to Project One soon, so I don't know if it will look like this in the, in the future, but um, there's a lot to be discovered. Thank you very much. Do we have these? Ah, good. Mics are alive. My name's Todd Harvey. I'm a curator at the American Folklife Center. I'm proud to be a member of the American Folklife Center staff, um, an organization that can bring together a group like this for a whole day and keep them in their seats. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I hope to continue uh, to uh, continue the discussion. The discussion to me is, has been about, uh, about collections and about access. And that's, uh, of course, the, the two kind of central tenets of of working in archives, you have to um, gather the materials and uh, and preserve them, and you have to create access. and And um, we work with that every day. in In 1932 or so, um, the archive of, of American folk song, as it was called at the time, consisted of about 900 wax cylinder recordings. Um, this year, we're going to um, accession among other things, uh, uh, Virginia's um, 85,000 plus oral histories with StoryCorps.me. So there's a, there's a slight shift in scale with that. And, and with that comes access, right? And um, in, uh, in 1932, there was no access to the archive. This is the first point of access that we had as an archive, and it's a 1934 publication, uh, the reading room's copy of American Ballads and Folk Songs by John Lomax and Alan Lomax, which contains, among other things, transcriptions of some of the recordings that they had made or um, that they had themselves transcribed in the field. They, uh, you know, according to my research, there was no way for anyone to listen to any of those discs if even they were at the archive. I think most of them were still in the Lomax's possession. Um, and, and so from, from this uh, publication, the paper publication, 
again, we have uh, StoryCorps.me, which uh, is a brand new collection, and there's uh, instantaneous access to that thing. Um, so we'll be talking about different ways to, uh, to access and different approaches to access to the material in our archives. And we've assembled uh, a panel of notables um, that I would like to introduce to you. Um, next to me is Lance Ledbetter. He's the, um, the, he and his wife April are Dust to Digital Records. And Lance has been a great friend uh, to the archive in publishing some of our materials. And um, we hope to cultivate that wonderful relationship uh, long into the future. Um, Kelly Navies is from the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. You just have to say, the new museum. <laughs> and everyone knows what you're talking about there. In, it, I, I can't imagine how we got her away from there. Uh, so close to the opening. It wasn't easy. <laughs> but she's here for a good reason, and that is um, uh, per Congress's um, mandate, we have worked with that, that museum to create the Civil Rights Oral History Project, and, and Kelly has been integral to it, as has John Bishop, the man next to her. Um, John was the, the, is, is a filmmaker, and they let him out for the day from, from Los Angeles um, to come and, and sit with us. And he was the, he's the man behind the camera. If you go to uh, those oral histories, which are online through the American Folklife Center website, you'll see his work. And John has deep, deep roots um, with the American Folklife Center, um, going back to his work with Alan Lomax um, on uh, Land Where the Blues Began and um, a number of other projects. And then uh, farthest away, uh, Gabriela Perez Baez from the National, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Uh, one, of the, one of the great assets in our collections uh, are the recordings of native peoples of, of North America and South America and Central America. And one project to bring those out into, uh, out into the world is called Breath of Life. And I hope that she'll talk um, about that. And I wonder if we'll, we'll, we should just start at, at that far end and work our way this direction, and I'll turn it over. Thank you. And so this is very good. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I am the Curator of Linguistics at the National Museum of Natural History in the Anthropology Department, and I'm also the Director of Recovering Voices. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about recovering voices, and I'll finish uh, um, with the, in, in, to talk uh, talking about the Breath of Life uh, Institute, which um, is a big focus of uh, our work in recovering voices. So, um, sorry, I'm having to use my two hands to navigate. It's a little confusing. But um, so the Recovering Voices is, uh, we like to call it a response uh, from the Smithsonian Institution to the um, language endangerment and knowledge, uh, endangerment of knowledge systems uh, crisis around the world. So of the six or 7,000 languages uh, spoken around the world, it's known that at least a third, if not more, are in the process of being replaced by other more dominant languages, whether regionally or internationally. And it could the forecast uh, suggests that as many as 90% of these languages could potentially go silent by the end of the century. Mm -hmm. So what can a museum do? Uh, we have articulated uh, an approach based on research uh, on languages and knowledge systems to understand the loss of cultural diversity and develop effective responses to, to reverse it. Um, this is based on access to collections. Uh, so this access is central to the recovery and, re and generation of knowledge in the process. Um, and global impact is achieved through partnerships with communities and academic institutions, one of them being the, uh, the Library of Congress. Um, what distinctive competence do we offer? Um, among many assets at the museum, we have the National Anthropological Archives. And also within the many assets at the NAA are 9,000 linear feet of manuscripts 
dating back to the, um, the book dates back to the 1800s, but we have manuscripts that go back to the 1600s from everywhere around the world. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a very extensive collection of film uh, at the uh, Human uh, Studies Film Archives, um, as well as photographs and artwork. Um, in outside the uh, archives and in our, in our collections, we have uh, over 126 million objects, and that means um, natural specimens, uh, it means uh, mineral samples, it means um, ethnographic uh, material culture collections. So the point is to capitalize on these collections and on the intellectual capital of the institution um, to be able to put these strengths to the service of uh, community-based researchers who are looking to revitalize their languages, their knowledge systems, their cultures. Um, we have two programmatic, we have several programmatic activities, but two of them that I want to focus on today are the Community Research Program and the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages. Uh, I'll just say National Breath of Life for short. Um, community Research Program, this is um, a program through which we fund a visit uh, to our museum or our institution collections, not exclusively the museum, uh, for community research who have a, a, an articulated project uh, for revitalization of language, of knowledge, or culture. And so um, we will fund up to $10,000 in, in uh, travel expenses for a group, uh, preferably intergenerational, preferably interdisciplinary, uh, but not tied to any specific uh, academic credentials uh, to come and carry out uh, research in collections, uh, again, at the Nat National Museum of Natural History or NMAI, uh, or any other unit in the Smithsonian, or, although it tends to, the research tends to focus on the collections of these two museums. Um, and National Breath of Life. Um, the National Breath of Life, it follows the model of the California Breath of Life, which began in the 1990s and takes place every uh, two years. Uh, and it's a, it's a training program to provide um, capacity, it's a capacity building prog uh, program to uh, train researchers from communities on research on archives uh, and research in linguistics for the purposes of language reclamation. At the origin in California, the focus was on tribes who no longer had first language speakers. Um, this later uh, expanded and two institutes were held in Oklahoma at the Sam Noble Museum uh, we have held three National Breath of Life Institutes, and we now have uh, funding secured from the National Science Foundation Documenting Endangered Languages Program to hold the 2017 um, Institute, May 29 to June 9th of next year. Um, so the point is to bring uh, researchers to DC so that they can have access to the unparalleled collections at the National Museum of Natural History, notably the Anthropological Archives, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Library of Congress. Um, the, uh, the objective is to familiarize participants with the holdings at these uh, institutions, teach fundamentals of linguistics so that they can begin to read and interpret uh, the materials. So for this purpose, each participant gets paired up with a uh, an academically trained linguist, uh, and from day one, they work on uh, the analysis of manuscripts on languages that they're interested in. Um, the, they discuss and demonstrate ways that materials can be uh, utilized for purposes of language revitalization and learning, and provide optional short sessions on computer technology, dictionary development, songwriting, writing systems, etc. Um, we, are, we have now worked with over 50 um, languages and we'll add another 14 or 15 in 2017. Um, it has been critical to partner with the Library of Congress, especially uh, given our joint uh, history uh, tied to the uh, Federal Cylinder Project. So the materials here, the songs are, the, the um, prayers are really critical to these researchers. Um, these researchers get uh, very technical linguistics training so that they can 
uh, decipher, so to speak, some of the um, language documentation produced by linguists, but they're really, really more interested in being able to regain cultural knowledge that is in these collections. And in that respect, the Library of Congress collection is essential. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bishop? Well, I, I'm not sure why I'm on the panel, because mostly I shoot film and edit film and produce um, things. But as a freelance camera person, I've, I'm often am involved in large-scale, what they be called documentation. I worked with the dance department at UCLA and you know, did films on Hawaiian dance, did several projects on Cambodian dance. And um, one thing that I realized um, in, make, in shooting documentation is that people don't really want to be documented. They want to be loved. <laughs> and it's in the, it's a, actually it sounds like a joke, but it's very, very true. The, they're engaging with you when you're shooting. It can be a dance. They're not going to show you the steps. They're going to dance for you. Um, people, when we do the civil rights oral history interviews, we're not just getting a story told. They're performing the story for us. And, um, and the resulting tape is a glimpse into that moment when this information was shared. There's a lot more valence to it than just what can be abstracted from the words. And <clears throat> I, I just wanted to mention that as something that should be kept in mind, that um, it's very easy when you're, well, it used to be, now, with, now I just use my cell phone, but in the olden days when you were um, photographing with, like they're doing in the back, it's easy to get lost up and swept up in your technology, you know, your, um, your craft. And, and in the kind of work we all do, it's, it's much more important to nail the craft before you go out, out. Be, know how to get it into focus, make a nice composition, and then you're engaged, you as the craftsperson are actually engaged in a communication with the person. On the oral history interviews, um, we've been, we have usually just myself and the oral historian, and it's a, it's a convert, it's, it's, it's a relationship in those, those two hours. Um, another point I'd like to make about shooting um, for documentary projects is that it really helps to visualize how the material will be used. Um, on, so in, on my darkest days, I see it going into a lead-lined box deep in a pyramid in the desert. Uh, <laughs> At other times, though, I, I, see the, I, I can see it being used a little bit of stock footage. Someone might want to pull material that we shoot for essentially to doc, document um, aspects of, of craft or aspects of performance or history. Um, I can visualize it um, being, being edited, being presented, either in short pieces or with the civil rights um, oral histories, I, I go crazy by about the third interview in the sequence because I'm editing it in my mind. Oh, so-and-so said that. That goes along with what someone else was saying because um, in this case, we're, we're building a tapestry. The, the documentation is building an enormous tapestry of, of a huge historical event. Um, event. Um, the, the other point I'd like to make is just to give 100,000 props to the Library of Congress for putting the first 100, and, I guess, 120 um, oral histories actually up on the web with the transcripts so anyone can access it live. <clears throat> they, can, they can feel what people are saying. They can read the transcript and, and get you know, to abstract information or to find where they are. This is something that, that's now technologically possible. Um, and um, this is the first time I've been involved in something that, um, thanks to Guha Shankar, who actually, does, actually makes it happen, um, first time in my life that, that material, I haven't had to wait for a year or two or 
whatever before things can circulate. Or um, you know, these these um, enterprises we are engaged in are done at great expense, great um, financial expense, and great personal expense. There's there's a lot of effort that goes into into it, um, and. It's extremely gratifying to see it actually being, being seen. So I'll, I'll let I'll give it someone else have that minute and a half. <laughs> Thanks, John. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kelly Navies. I'm museum specialist, oral historian at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. I would like to thank the Library of Congress for inviting me here today. We are, as you know, very busy. But I'm very happy to be on this panel, and I'm glad that you're here, Mr. Bishop, because I never met you. This is my first time meeting you. I'm, I'm relatively new, so I actually wasn't there for all of the interviews that he's talking about. But I'm going to share a little bit more about that project. The oral history program at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture is, as you know, a new and evolving program. Our goal is to produce and collect oral history content for our growing collection. In addition, we are committed to making this material accessible and usable to our many publics, general, scholars, researchers, teachers, and students. These various constituencies should be able to access oral history materials, not just recordings, but associated documentation, both online and by coming into the museum. In addition, our collection is intended to support the work and research of our curators as they develop exhibitions. In the years prior to our opening and prior to my joining the program, we began to collect oral histories through our collaboration with the Library of Congress on the Civil Rights Oral History Project. And you've been hearing a little bit about that. The Civil Rights History Project began in 2009 when the US Congress passed the, the Civil Rights History Project Act. This law directed the Library of Congress and the National Museum of African American History and Culture to conduct a nationwide survey of existing oral history collections with relevance to the civil rights um, history movement and to record new interviews with people who participated in the movement. There have been approximately 144 interviews conducted and recorded on film. Some of these interviews are with well-known movement icons, but many others are with less known, less known individuals who played important roles in the movement. The significance of these interviews is immense. Their content reveals the work and day-to-day -day experiences of major players, not just in the South, but throughout the United States. For example, the most recent cohort of interviews were done in Southern California with former members of the Black Panther Party and the Brown Berets. One of my favorite interviews is with Freeman Rabowski. Dr. Rabowski is known mostly in academic circles for his work as the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he has developed a highly successful math and science program that targets those who are historically represented in those fields. What is less known is his role in the Children's Crusade of Birmingham, Alabama, and the fact that he was actually friends with the four girls who were killed in the bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963. During his interview with uh, Dr. Joe Manier of the Southern Oral History Program at UNC Chapel Hill, where I'm also from, by the way, Dr. Rabowski gives a poignant and moving telling of this chapter in his life and the life of our nation. In his story, one is struck by the trajectory of his life from the upheaval and trauma of those early years to his contemporary role as a committed activist in the sphere of academics. What this and other oral history interviews from this collection reveal is that Beyond the retelling of historical events, oral histories have the power to inspire and trigger the much needed healing process. As a nation, we are still grappling with the trauma of racial violence, and it is one of the goals of the National Museum of African American History and Culture to be a place of healing as well as a place of learning. With the availability of this collection, a visitor can view the display of Emmett Till's coffin and then go and listen to the reflections of those like the Ladner sisters who were directly impacted by Till's murder in 1955. Another strength of the Civil Rights History Project is the diversity it portrays. In addition to the integration of the well-known with the less celebrated, it also showcases stories of non-black, such as Luis Zapata, a Latino American who grew up in Orange County, California, and became active in the United Farm Workers, and then moved to Mississippi to become active in both SNCC and the Mississippi Freedom Labor Union. 
Then there's the story of David and Satoko Ackerman, an interracial couple, Caucasian and Japanese, who met at the Chicago Theological Seminary and were then recruited by fellow student Jesse Jackson to join the march from Selma to Montgomery. There are also many interviews with the women of the movement, like Dr. Kathleen Cleaver of the Black Panther Party, and sisters Joyce and Dory Ladner, who have led lifetimes of activism through involvement in the NAACP, SNCC, and in many other campaigns for justice. The cultural and gender diversity displayed in these interviewees provides a more complete picture of what we call the movement and enriches our understanding of the contextual experience of those we call activists. What motivates them? What are their lives like on a day-to-day -day basis? There are also interviews with siblings and whole families which shed light on the ways in which the civil rights movement impacted not just individuals, but social networks and entire communities. I have already used this collection to introduce foreign students to our oral history collection. Students from Southeast Asia were very interested in how oral history enables one to capture stories of trauma and oppression and were anxious to go home and record their own stories as well as interview their relatives. One of the reasons I am so passionate about oral history is that there are so many layers of meaning and so many ways of using the material. I look forward to presenting oral history to our many publics through exhibits and a variety of programs and through training and workshops. The Civil Rights History Project is a good model for the kind of oral history work we plan to do. Collaborations with other institutions that produce rich oral histories that have multifaceted meanings and applications. Most recently, I have been directing um, an oral history project with individuals who donated significant items and artifacts to our collection. As a museum, our oral history collection is deeply connected to the material collection. There are interviews with artifact donors that reveal not just the provenance of particular pieces, but also the relationship of these items to the lives of those who once possessed them and how these stories fit into the larger narrative of African American history and culture. I'll take questions later. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lance Ledbetter from uh, Dust to Digital. Um, as Todd was saying, we are a record company. Uh, my, it's just my wife and myself, and uh, we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I think a record company like ours, there's not really a roadmap for, um, for what we do. We've sort of uh, evolved over time, but I wanted to walk through today and kind of tell the story about how we got to work with such great archives as the Library of Congress, um, the Florida Folklife Program, the Center for Southern Folklife, the Association for Cultural Equity, and the University of Georgia Archives, among others. Uh, our label started in 2003 with the release of a box set called Goodbye Babylon. And what we were trying to do with that set was, um, you know, it's all gospel music recorded between 1902 to 1960. But what we were trying to do was provide access point to this uh, sort of overwhelming amount of content by showing like subgenres of the different styles of gospel music. We worked with musicologists like Dick Spotswood, Charles Wolfe, and Tony Russell to produce a set that sort of told the story of gospel music while making very subjective selections to give people an access point. Um, during the four and a half years to produce Goodbye Babylon, we sort of set the standards, aesthetic standards, and mission of our label. Um, we decided we wanted to produce high quality cultural artifacts and what, what I mean by that is we wanted to have top-notch documentation with beautiful packaging and terrific design. We thought that the music was so important we wanted to elevate it to, you know, to this, this thing that was beautiful where people would hopefully pay attention. And that was back in 03 when there was a lot less distractions than there are now. Um, in 2004, um, Art Rosenbaum and I met, and Art Rosenbaum, for those of the, for those of you that don't know, um, he made field recordings for probably about 40 years, um, and they're housed at the University of Georgia Archives, where Art was a professor. Um, Art, Art and I had several conversations. He was a fan of Goodbye Babylon, and we talked about possibly doing something similar, like a similar model for his field recordings. So. Art and I spent about a year and a half just listening 
to all of his recordings and it was just a, it was a great great experience to to do that with somebody as uh as incredible as art rosenbaum and um and the set we produced was called art of field recording it came out in 2008. it was uh well received and um it was it was our first work with a with an archive it was with the university of georgia archive uh, before that time we were only working with private record collectors um, the, the, like I said, the set was well received, actually even won a Grammy Award. And um, we were so excited, but at the same time, um, my wife and I, although it was a terrific experience, we, we realized, you know, to take a year and a half to listen to audio and still be a, you know, functioning record company putting out <laughs> records, uh, we needed to refine that process a little bit. Uh, so, so we did, you know, we started to, uh, to hear from other archives, you know, I think the Art of Field recording set sort of put us on the archival um, map with people that had uh, lots of great material. Um, the next set that we did with an archive was the Drop On Down in Florida set, which was a, it was a reissue of a double LP that the, the Florida State Folk Life Program had put out in the 1980s. Um, and they wanted to do like an expanded edition. So we, we kept their original notes, we expanded the liner notes, and we expanded the audio to, to be two CDs. It's almost like double the audio material as the original double LP. Um, but in doing so, we worked a lot with the archive. We let them develop a lot of the, make a lot of the decisions in the development stages. What we sort of shifted our expertise to was um, more in the, the helping them with the concepts, the packaging, the design, the marketing, the manufacturing, and the distribution. Um, and, and that set was, was well received too. We, we didn't win a Grammy, but it was, uh, it was very well received and it, it came together very well and it sort of tested this, uh, this sort of new approach for us to where we could work with an archive and have them using their expertise in their field and us using our expertise in our field. <laughs> So since then, we've, uh, we've worked with several, ar several more archives, including the Library of Congress. We worked with um, Jim Leary at the University of Wisconsin to do um, a set folk songs from another America. And uh, we, that was a partnership with the University Press, the uh, University of Wisconsin Press. And since then, we've done another Library of Congress project. We did the, uh, it was sort of similar to the drop on down in Florida where it was um, originally put out as a three LP set in the 70s, uh, Music of Morocco, which was recorded by Paul Bowles. And uh, that set that came out um, earlier this year has been probably one of our, our best received projects in, in several years. So, you know, I wanted to just kind of say how, you know, what our process is how we've evolved to work with more archives. And I think what we, you know, as a label bring to the, to this, um, you know, the sharing is with a physical package, you have a beginning and you have an end. And you can direct people, you know, to the infinite archive, the online material, you know, that's something that we can help, you know, raise awareness of what archives have in, in the context of, you know, consumerism and, 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 and record, record nerds and you know all that stuff and we get those people to appreciate and come to learn about all the great work that archives like the Library of Congress does. Thank you. Mm. Right, I wonder if we can go straight to questions. This is uh, some, some fascinating <laughs> folks. Can I ask those questions? Yeah. <laughs> no? I just wanted to comment on Freeman Robowski. It was one of the more intense in interviews. And um, the story that when he told about the girls in Birmingham, um, he was crying, I was crying. I'm really good at staying in focus when I'm crying. Um, and we had to pause. And he said that he hadn't told that story in 30 years, but it was the attention we were paying to him. He just literally, that he would, that he felt moved just to tell it he had, what he had not intended to. It's a very powerful segment, and you edited it quite well. So, yeah. Hey, Mary. Yeah, I wanted to say how much I appreciate. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful session, of course. <laughs> Thank you for putting it together. Um, I wanted to just say to John Bishop how much I appreciate uh, your, your bringing out the um, 
the recording and the uh, photograph as really an artifact of the relationship between the photographer, the field worker, and the person. And um, I, yeah, I don't think we paid enough attention to that in our session this morning because we were, we were almost, we were on the verge of getting there but didn't get there. Mm. And, and I just love the way that you've drawn that out. Um, do you, so, so, well, wh so, what do you, so, so where does that go when you're looking at these decontextualized artifacts? Can you as a photographer read those? Well, uh, I, I as a way, I mean, Ann, Ann Hoog actually, she anticipated, she said, look at, look at these, these pictures. You can see that there's a relationship between the photographer and the subject. Can you talk about that? Hmm. Well, I could see it in the photographs that you showed in, in your presentation. Um, what do you do about it? Or? Well, can you just, just say something more about the photographer? Um, well, it's, there's, a, there's a leap that you have to make between the te what you're doing technically and aesthetically, um, you, 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 I don't think I don't consider myself an artist. I'm, you know, it's that's I'm not there to make art, but I feel an obligation when I take people's time to do to do something with with it. Often it comes in a compulsion to edit what I've shot after an interval of time goes by. I'll remember the, something they said or some beautiful movement they did or something and feel that I, I have to make the film just to get these three things in. And you know, th there's that, that sort of post thing. Um, otherwise, it, you know, it's just um, I, um, I, people seem to tolerate me pretty well. so. <laughs> Well, well, I, I think that's part of the, what, what happens in your case as well, that you, people liked you and you, you got along with them. Some, someone this morning used the term shoulder to shoulder as um, in, in field work, but, but in a sense we're, we're expanding that to be um, inter-institutional or, or across uh, professional lines with these folks because uh, they, are, they are providing access to our collections, and John didn't mention uh, media generation, his, his, um, the distribution aspect of his creative work, um, which is in a, in a way similar to to Dust to Digital in that they are providing great access and beautiful access to archival material. Um, No, no, no. <laughs> well, it, Mary's question and John's remarks, you know, make me think, help me out. Am I remembering the term reflexivity? Is that one of those <laughs> words that we hear in yeah. hot dog? <laughs> uh, I, th I think a characteristic of, of what you're talking about and what we did, in fact, see in the pictures this morning has to do with a willingness and a consciousness of the importance of reflexivity in the work of documentation that we did and what it gives you at least in, in, in those pictures that we saw because the team in a sense gave a meta documenter of the documentary act um, in, in, as was said, an enriched contextual thing that lets you understand the document qua document, if you see what I mean, because you not only have the document, you also sort of have a sense of how it was made. But it's also a reflexive process. I mean, I remember I worked on that book of bluegrass photos with Neil Rosenberg, and the text is threaded through with how the two of us drove hither and thither and ran into people. So we're part of the story. and. You know, there may be egotism involved, but I think it was also, you know, to contextualize it. But this is the sort of thing you're really good at, so what do you think? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, well, I, I, I wasn't quite thinking of it so much as, uh, although, although, yeah, I mean, I think reflexivity as this sort of two-headed aspect that you have to have when you're doing ethnography. You have to be able to, as you, you say, the metadata, but you have to be able to, to be, be Im 
to, to move very rapidly between being absorbed in the interaction and standing back and giving it a, la a label, a metadata. This is, you know, here's what we're doing and here's what I'm gonna ask next or whatever. Uh, but this, this whole business of the, the photograph Reflect, well, reflecting, reflexivity, reflecting something of, of the relationship that is going on. I think um, that that's, that's something that the, the big moment, I remember Alan one time saying that the, the, the great insight of the 20th century was context. And that the context, uh, you know, across the philosophies and, the, and sciences and so forth. Um, and, uh, so, so we shifted around the time that the American Folklife Center and the legislation was passed. We shifted from this idea of, from this um, ta uh, practice of of collecting nuggets, d yeah, texts and and images and so forth, and uh, to actually um, going off in search of those more moments of what Del Himes called breakthrough into performance, mm -hmm. where. The, and and then then turning that so that these um, uh, these things in the archives are potentially very living mm -hmm. documents. I mean, they, they, wh what happens to those relationships? I think of the, it as the what Bakhtin called the difference between the difference the difference is not between body and soul, or matter and and uh, mind, but between. Um, flesh fallen and tra flesh transfigured, and the, the transfigurement is in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And you take that, uh, you just take the do you take the document or whatever, and it's like what Barry Tolkien said is a footprint, you know, of an interaction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> Over here. Wow. Hi, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, comment to Gabriela that I appreciate the the work that you do among many others for recovering voices and uh, breath of life because I think it's a really wonderful example of how these amazing institutions that physically are located in DC can give back to communities all over the world um, especially indigenous communities and I was hoping you could talk about some sort of concrete examples of what you saw people take home with them, what did they take with them to their communities, even though it lives in the archives? How are those relationships expanding? Um, good question. <laughs> so, okay, so we've done Breath of Life three times, and I think I would say that what they, t they take with them is a lot of excitement. What ends up happening is that our holdings are so extensive that two weeks of intensive training in linguistics, intensive training into uh, what the archives hold it ends up being super overwhelming in a good way. Um, and, and they leave and they're, they're very excited to know that all of this material has, exists and it's a resource for them to use. Now, what we're trying to do now, because one thing that we don't have a good handle on is what happens after they leave. And so, for example, uh, we have experiences with the uh, Shmuich, the barbarian Yachumash, and with the Seneca groups where they left uh, knowing uh, when they were here for Breath of Life, they had developed an inventory of all the materials that they had. And we were able to take that inventory and, and we had an opportunity to digitize the materials. Um, I should mention that when, with Breath of Life, we digitize a, a selection of materials so that um, the participants have something to work on right off the bat. Day one, they have a digital surrogate that they can work on. Um, and we choose that very carefully depending on the vitality of the language, the experience that the person might have in doing linguistic um, research or not. Um, and we select something that they can start working on right away. We also have post-institute uh, di uh, post digitization funds. So if they discovered something that they really want, we can dig digitize it. But generally, the collections tend to be very extensive and, and they go away knowing that there's boxes and boxes, especially when it comes to uh, languages and cultures documented in the Harrington collection, for example. It's just massive what they, they might have. So anyway, in the case of the Seneca and the, and the Chumash um, 
groups, we were able to do follow-up in two different ways. So the Seneca developed an inventory of all the materials. We happened to have a digitization grant, so we were able to digitize the entire collection of Seneca materials and return that to them to, at no charge to, to the uh, community, to the researchers. So now they have all this wealth. They're still overwhelmed, but they have the stuff with them and they can start uh, digging through. Uh, and I'll go back to that point. Um, the, with the Barbarinia Chumash, they, dis, they knew that there was a lot of stuff because this is one of the languages documented in the Harrington collection. So they came back, they came to Breath of Life, they worked on that for two weeks, then they applied for a community research program um, uh, uh, opportunity, uh, and they came back for a week, and I worked with them that whole week specifically to develop an inventory that they could uh, used to develop their notation so that they could always go back to the um, document of uh, where they could find a particular word. So for the Ch Barbarian Chumash, they, they, they have been reconstructing, for example, their, or they were working on their numeral system, and they had found number 24, number 26, which allowed them, uh, to, which provided an important clue as to how the numeral system was uh, constructed. So, but they needed to be able to pinpoint that one page in amidst the thousands of pages where that word is. So this was a rudimentary way to do it. Now, um, with those two experiences, we, um, I'm, I'm working with our partner, which is someone who I neglected to mention, but who's a critical partner in this endeavor, uh, Daryl Baldwin at the Miami, Miami Center, uh, which is at the Miami University. Uh, in Ohio, and he has led the revitalize the reclamation efforts for the Miami language. And one of the things that they have developed is this tool to be able to manage digital surrogates, annotate them, an analyze them, translate whatever it is necessary for that given manuscript, and so uh, an and output in in a dictionary format or another. Uh, way. So now we're working to try to figure out how we can use this tool to present it at a Breath of Life Institute and allow the participants to take that, take that tool with them and be able to carry out the work, the work once they leave. So they can still leave overwhelmed, but with a tool where they can start plowing away in a methodological, systematic manner. So we're learning a lot about what communities need and don't need what they know and don't know. And we're very mindful that um, what we're asking these communities to do when we're giving them access to the archives is that we're asking them to become linguists, to become folklorists, to become archivists, to become ethnographers, and they're just average people. So it's really important that we understand what access really means. It's not just letting them come in for two weeks. It's actually creating an environment where that access is meaningful to whatever um, goals they have. Um, I, I second the comments. This was a great presentation. Uh, my question is for Kelly. I'm wondering if you could expand on the concept of the many publics that you described and um, talk about that idea in the context of the own, your own collections that you're building in your programs. Sure, that's a great question. Well, I was actually thinking while you were talking how important it is to empower the communities to be able to do that work. Because one of the things that I'm getting as essentially the only oral historian right now are requests from all over the country. I know this person that needs to be interviewed right now, tomorrow, in addition to requests from our own staff. So one of my, my biggest jobs is gonna be managing our in, internal requests with the requests coming from the public. Um, I'm someone who has a background in community oral history, and so it's really important to me to, to create um, a, a situation where the community can come and be educated to go back and do their own work. They may or may not donate th that work to us, um, but I think it's important to encourage people to donate to their uh, local historical societies and libraries as well. But the important thing is that they have those skills and the mm -hmm. training to do that. And I was really glad to hear that that's one of the things that you're doing because I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that with our program as well. So we have the communities, we have churches, we have um, 
different uh, social institutions, activist groups like Black Lives Matter, th um, groups like that that will come to us. That, that is a public. Then you have individuals, families. We also have a genealogist. One thing that's, I think, relatively new is that we have a, a permanent oral historian and a permanent professional genealogist on staff. Um, there will be a family oral history center, so people will be trained to not just conduct oral history, but to do genealogical research. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we're planning to reach out to the public. There'll be classrooms, we'll invite uh, classes in. Um, I, I really uh, enjoy doing public trainings and, and workshops, so that's one of the things that we're looking forward to getting started as soon as possible. Um, does that answer your question? Sure. I'm wondering if it's in the cards for you to, um, to use the American Folklife Center collections as well in that outreach. I mean, can we, can we kind of piggyback I mean, on those communities? I, I think we love working with the Library of Congress. I mean, I, <laughs> yes, I mean, absolutely. They're, these are rich collections. And I'm excited. Actually, I collect records, so I really oh, yeah. want, to, yeah, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> well, well, Lance, how, how does that fit into what, what you all do? I mean, what communities are you building? Well, I think, uh, you know, since we started, you know, every every release, I think we're up to we're over 50 releases now. And you know, what we try to do is is stretch, maybe what our audience might expect. You know, we try to explain to them why it's important, and and not everything like we we kind of look at our fan base as being adventurous listeners. So not everything is going to be for everyone, but w w with each new release, we hopefully bring more people to the audience. You know, more people to sort of the. Uh, you know, what, what's coming next, you know, kind of build excitement. And I think that's what we try to bring, you know, to, to archives that we work with is like trying to figure out what is the hooks that might help get people that read, you know, Pitchfork or Mojo or whatever it is, what's going to express to them, like, maybe I should check that out. Well, how'd you do that with the Morocco box set? Um, I mean, so, you know, I knew Paul Bowles, the fact that he made those recordings, I knew that his name connected to it was going to be a, um, you know, a big seller, but I didn't realize how big, you know, his, his fan base is very obsessed with him, you know, and they want, <laughs> they want his liner note, they'll buy a box set just to get his liner notes, you know, so it was, uh, it was, it was a little surprising how, 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 you know, his fan base reacted, but it was great. I mean, it was really exciting. Did you have a question, Alan? or comment? I just had a general question. The phrase oral history has been used widely <laughs> uh, yes. today, and uh, I'm interested in the history of that phrase mm. uh, because I think it would tell us something about, you know, it, you know, how it was generated. And oral history, well, history is either oral or written you know, literally speaking. And, but to invent the phrase oral history, a lot of people say, well, what's the name of that historian from Columbia invented oral history? Well, that, that, I didn't have any way to deny that. <laughs> but on the other hand, <laughs> I ran across a letter in Alan Lomax's correspondence at the library here from the 30s that used the phrase oral history. And so the phrase is old, older than the Columbia professor who was post-World uh, War II. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have any insight into that? And That's a big question. Um, yeah. I don't know who first coined the phrase, but you are correct. It does go back to the early 20s and 30s. Um, and is, is, it, is Doug Boyd still here? He may know. <laughs> uh, I think it's an interesting um, question, though, because people often misunderstand what oral history is. And obviously, within this group of people, we all have an idea or a definition. We may not all agree on it, but we do have an idea. But when I'm out in the world and I tell people I do oral history, the first thing they think is, you tell stories. You're a storyteller. And I have to I always have to explain to them, no, that's that's not what I do. But it's interesting that that's the first thing that they think when they hear oral history. So it does make you wonder about the term itself <laughs> and, and how accurate it is in describing what we do. But, that's, but in terms of the actual evolution of that term, that's a, that's a good question. Guha? 
this has nothing to do with oral histories, uh, <laughs> although only, only tangentially. Um, so you all have been a very nice, polite, and uh, not to say also good-looking bunch. And, uh, and that's you. all been very uh, kind of you to speak so nicely of the archives. Um, maybe, if it's not too uh, impossible a question, could you talk perhaps about what are your biggest frustrations with using archival materials? Because we certainly, working at the library, working in the museum, working at the archives uh, of the American Folklife Center, we need to know from the user base, and not just the fan base, as to what we do and what we could do better. Uh, sorry, I mean, any, any, that any, and all of you. That's for the audience. Yeah. Well, Anybody. you guys, I guess, since you're the since you're the principal users, okay, but well. also from other yeah. folks here. Hmm. Take it away. You're trying to get us in trouble up here. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to provide better service. <laughs> yes. Um, somebody else start. Well, I hardly ever try and get anything out of you, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you're always extremely pleasant to work with, whether you know what for advice or um, fixing a recording or things like that. Um, it, it's, I don't know, I, I, and I can tell you about a Canadian experience I had. I was making, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. tried to access the collections as an, as an outsider as, uh, before, I, before I came to work for the Smithsonian. Um, I'm also a librarian by training. I, I, I think that, um, a challenge is deciding what the accurate search term is. And that's even for me as a librarian, when you're trying to narrow down, if you're looking for photographs or you're looking for a specific interview, I think that is always a challenge. And I'm not, I think, I know that's something that we're, we, we work on in cataloging. Um, but that is, that's an area that we, are, we need to work on more. So, all of us, because we're trying to do the same thing now within the museum to make people um, aware of the collection and, and find what it is that they're looking for. But how, how do you know, for example, that Freeman, I mean, although we do have metadata that lists certain topics, but you wouldn't necessarily know that Freeman Rabowski talks about Emmett Till just, just by knowing that his interview is in our collection, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways to make that information uh, easier for the public to, to discern. As a video guy, uh, maybe for Mr. Bishop, but also audiophiles, in this day and age, it seems like we're going to shorter and shorter, shorter sound bit bites and things like that. How important do you feel it is to kind of document things in a longer form and maybe an unedited, unvarnished, and let people have maybe their full say because you're seeing shorter and shorter sound bites in the media and things like that. So how important is for multiple places to give like the full unedited, maybe unvarnished look into our history so people get a full capsule of it, do you feel? Uh, I'm working on two films now. One is um, with Jay Komiak at the Smithsonian Anthropology Department um, with Rastafarian elders who are very loquacious and, and difficult to understand. They, they're going to need some subtitling outside the Jamaican community. Uh, and um, I've gone back and forth in my own thinking and talking with, with Jake about um, alternative ways of presenting it. Um, they all need, uh, each of the in interviews we did require some trimming. I mean, they, they go all over the map and they come back. So there should be some you know, consolidating to make it flow like a you know, coherent piece. But it might be more useful to have it as a series of things, 10 minutes or, or to even a 20 minute one with, with some annotations going with it and make it this hyper more of a hypertexted, because no one's going to want to watch 90 minutes. And I'm not sure we could ever cut it down to 90 minutes. <laughs> um, are you familiar with the concept of the SNU, the, the smallest narrative unit? Um, this, this is, there's a movement to, um, to build platforms for dealing with these so people can pull the small narrative units um, together and, and weave their own piece. I don't have much confidence that people will have the patience for that, but it's an interesting idea in thinking when you have large bodies of material, um, what's going to be the smallest narrative units that you can use possibly to, to 
use in multiple ways or string in multiple ways. Friends, I think that, um, that we have reached the cameraman, that he's asking us questions, <laughs> means that we've done our job, that we've saturated this audience with thought and ideas. And I thank you all very much for joining me today. It's great to meet you. Yeah. So just in closing, I'd like to kind of reiterate something that my colleague Todd Harvey said, which is what a privilege it is to work at a place like the American Folklife Center, where we have such wonderful collections and such wonderful people who are dedicated to making these collections accessible to everyone. Um, and not only can we bring a group of wonderful people like this together for a whole day, as Todd said, we hope to be able to do so for a whole 1.5 days, because we are going to continue uh, this tomorrow, of course. And tomorrow, we're going to be talking about two uh, sort of separate communities that, that, that have issues um, the, or whose who's, um, oral narratives and whose material has have, have issues for uh, for collectors and for archivists and those are indigenous communities and veterans so we'll be talking specifically about our indigenous collections and about the veterans history project tomorrow so we welcome you back tomorrow to hear about those materials but we'd also like to thank a whole lot of people for uh, for today. So first of all, I'd like to thank the staff of the American Folklife Center, uh, who's done such a great job in putting this together. Uh, particularly those people who you saw up here on the stage, but also um, uh, a number of people like Thea Austin, who does a lot of work on these events, but does not get seen on the stage. So we'd like to thank them as well. We'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers from today, including this wonderful panel here. Uh, there have just been such great uh, uh, ideas being thrown around and so many different ideas and so much to think about. So we would really like to thank everyone who spoke today. Uh, a round of applause for them as well. We'd like to thank our sound crew and our video crew. They're helping us uh, get this together and, and put it on the web, as I said, so that this, like the archival materials that we're talking about, will be accessible. And that's a really important thing. So we, we, we'd like to thank them as well. And finally, one thing that, that came up again and again uh, in our discussions today was uh, how the Library of Congress goes about working with all this material. And one thing that we should say is that the American Folklife Center is not uh, you know, an, an isolated unit. We actually work within a library that has uh, a lot of resources available for us to work with, including uh, a whole uh, ITS team that puts things, uh, puts things like this on the web, and also uh, a whole web team that puts our materials on the web. So there's just a whole lot of people throughout the Library of Congress in all the divisions that we work with that we really couldn't do our jobs without them. So we'd like to thank them as well. And finally, we would like to thank you uh, for coming and participating in this in all the ways that you've done. And we really want you to, as I said, continue to, uh, to participate tomorrow. So we look forward to having you here tomorrow. Now, I would like to point out that the wall has been removed. We've broken the third wall. <laughs> uh, and this means that, or the fourth wall, I guess I should say. And this means that behind there, you will find a reception. Um, and any of you, of course, who have signed up for the dinners uh, will be proceeding to them after the reception is over. So now it's time to think about all those wonderful issues that came up within your discussions and remember the people that you wanted to ask a particular question of and find those people at the reception and we'll continue chatting then. So once again, uh, I'm Steve Winnick for the American Folklife Center and we will see you again tomorrow, but for the moment, let's hang out and have some fun. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.